Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Brock McMillan, and I calling, I'm calling this meeting to order at 6 o'clock p.m. on April 6, 2021. Um, due to COVID, continued presence of COVID in Utah and associated pu public health and safety risks, large public gatherings are strongly discouraged by the CDC and many local health departments. Based on these risks and risk recommendations, the Division of Wildlife Resources and the chair of this public body have determined that regional advisory council and wildlife board meetings will continue in a purely electronic format for the time being. Anyone wishing to comment on agenda topics in future meetings or to observe this meeting may do so by logging on to the division's webpage at wildlife.utah.gov slash feedback.html where instructions and links are provided. I'd like to welcome uh, all the RAC members, and we'll start with a roll call to see who's here. And so, AJ Maurer. AJ again, nope. Ben Louder. Here. Chris Schmitz. Here. Danny Potts. I'm here. Can you hear me? Yep. Very good, Danny. Okay. Eric Eric Reed. Present. Jake Steele. Josh Leonard. Here. Ken Strong. Here. Luke Decker. Mike Christensen. Present. Scott Jensen. Scott, I saw your name up. Are you here, buddy? Looks like he's trying to get his mute off. He's he's on the screen, just can't hear him. Hey, there we go. Okay. Hi, Scott. I'll catch up to speed. I'm here. Steve Lund. Let me go through the four that were not here. AJ Maurer, Jake Steele, Luke Decker, Steve Lund. Okay, thank you. I'd also like to welcome uh, the several individuals from the DNR that are with us, uh, specifically Kobe Jones, the big game coordinator, Rusty Robinson, the central region wildlife manager, Riley Peck, the once in a lifetime species coordinator, Chad Wilson, the private land, private lands public wildlife coordinator, and Justin Shannon, the wildlife program chief. I'd also like to welcome all the public that are watching on YouTube. Um, as you know, the public will not be able to provide live comments during this meeting. However, presentations were provided for viewing online and the public was able to provide comments to the RAC members for this RAC meeting. Um, I would like to ask for somebody to move that we uh, approve the agenda. Hey, I'd like to address that for a moment. Okay. Um, it seems like we have a disconnect in continuity of conversation in that the only items that are carried forward from one meeting rack meeting to the next and eventually to the board are items that are on this initial agenda. So in other words, if we make a change to the recommendations here, the next rack doesn't know about our change and the board will get a summary of those as each rack chair presents that. But it seems like we're just missing an opportunity to have a continuous conversation. If, if something is presented by a public person, that person has to go to every individual rack and bring it up. And that's one means, but that, that conversation can, 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 can continue. But for a rack, if we make a change to something, it kind of dies with us until it's reported to the board. So my suggestion is simply that if we make a change, um, that it be noted as a subtopic, like a 5A or a 5B, and then maybe just a, a link to our video and the timestamp that we go back to that. So the next RAC members, if they're interested, they can go back and say, hey, the Central Region RAC made a change suggestion. 
and this is the information of why they did it. Um, anyway, it just seems like there's got to be some way to create a con continuous conversation. It, it's a good idea, Scott. I'm not sure what you do. That that would lead to the earlier racks getting more representation than the later racks because we wouldn't be able to go look at what they proposed before we had our meeting. And that's exactly the case, but at least the conversation that starts would be carried forward to each additional rack. So I, I have... I have no problem with that. Well, I'll check with Stacy and see if, if there's an option there, or Jason can check with Stacy and see if that's an option. And uh, anyway, seems seems reasonable to me that everybody ha would have an opportunity to hear what everybody else discusses. Yeah. And I'm sure there are some board members that are watching, or some RAC members from the Southern Region RAC or, or whatever that are going to be watching tonight and hear what we're talking about as well. Thank you, Scott. I would entertain a motion to accept the minute, the agenda and minutes. So moved. Thank you, Ken. Second. Thank you, Ben. I'm writing down. Okay, I'll call for a vote. AJ, Ben Louder. Yes. Chris Schmitz. Christine. Christine, you're still on mute if you're trying to respond. We'll skip Christine for right now. Danny. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> Eric Reed. Yes. Josh Leonard. Yes, and I'll add, I like Scott's idea. I'm writing that down, by the way. Ken Strong. Yes. Uh, Mike Christensen. Yes. Scott Jensen. Yes. Uh, motion passes seven to zero. And I'll follow up on that other idea and I'll report back on our next meeting. Uh, I'll talk to Stacy Kuhn and, and Jason and we'll come up with a plan. Okay. Um, I guess the next thing on the agenda is for me to provide a brief update from the last board meeting. In fact, there have been two board meetings since we last met. Uh, the January board meeting um, on January 5th, and uh, I'll give you a summary of those motions and then I'll, I'll tell you about the other one. Um, let's see. The first uh, motion dealt with the 2021 Landowner Association permit recommendations. And the motion was that they approve the action permit number recommendations as presented by the division during the board meeting. And that, that motion passed with a vote of five to one. The next item on the agenda was the Black Bear Rule Amendments and Recommendations. The motion was they, to accept the division recommendations as presented. And that motion passed unanimously. And the final item of business was they moved that they requested uh, from the division of work session in March on a date that the division identified to discuss uh, mule deer biology and the status of the mule deer herd in Utah. And uh, that motion passed with a vote of five with one excused, which leads me to the second meeting uh, last month, the wildlife board had a work session and everybody was invited to at least watch that work session. And it was a full day meeting. Um, it started with a presentation from Kobe Jones, the big game coordinator on mule deer biology. And then Kent Hersey gave a presentation on uh, status of mule deer and, and what's affecting mule deer in the state of Utah. 
And then each of the regions provided the status of deer in each of their units. And they gave a little bit of background on the recommendation they have for permits this year, which I thought was very informative. Um, and, and that was the sum total. It was just a work session. It was just for information. There were no votes or anything like that. Any comments about the, the two board meetings? Hearing none, I'll turn the time over to Jason Vernon for a regional update. All right, thanks, Brock, and good evening, everyone. My name is Jason Vernon. I'm the regional supervisor for wildlife resources in the central region. Uh, just a few things I'd like to update this group um, about uh, some things that have been going on in the region over the last several months. Um, if you remember, last time we met, I announced that Rusty Robinson uh, took the position as our wildlife manager. Um, he was previously in the Nebo and the Manti uh, districts, district biologist there. Um, we filled that position in, and, and Wes Alexander is our new Nebo and Manti district biologist. Wes has been with us for over a decade in, in several positions in the region, in the wildlife section. We're super excited to have him on. He's going to be a great asset to us, and uh, hopefully you'll be able to reach out to him. And he's all, he lives in the district. He hunts in the district he knows a lot about the district so we're not going to skip a beat with him in there um over the last several months our biologists have been out through the region visiting bear dens um looking at those bears and and seeing if they have cubs or yearlings with them um our biologists are also starting to work on sage grouse let counts throughout the region um and then just last week they completed pronghorn flights out on the West Desert. Uh, from our aquatic section, um, last year in January, we started to work on the Strawberry Reservoir Fisheries Management Plan. Um, right about a third of the way through our process, COVID hit, and we've delayed meeting and having discussions about that. We did start that group up again last month. So we're hoping to, to get this uh, management plan put together and, and implemented by the fall of this year. Um, also, I asked about some, some fishing from our aquatics manager, Chris Crockett. They were down on Yuba uh, last month collecting pike. Uh, and what they collected was some pike, but they were catching a, a whole bunch of tiger muskies out of there and uh, 28, 30 inch tiger muskies. So if you're looking for some a hot fishing spot, that might be a place to go to get some tiger muskies. Um, in law enforcement, we have a few new sergeants in our region that started this last month. Two of our sergeants, well, one of our sergeants retired, Ray Loken retired from the Salt Lake District and uh, Sergeant Jay Topham was promoted to an investigator. So to, to fill those positions, Casey Mickelson is our sergeant in the Southern crew, and Dominic Barrett is our new sergeant in our Salt Lake District, and we're excited to have them on in those capacities. In our habitat section, um, our staff are gearing up for the summer field season. A uh, lot of work will be focused on our WMAs this coming summer including fixing fences, spraying weeds, new signage. Uh, unfortunately, a lot of the work will go into repairing vandalism and abuse that's happened over the winter and the fall of, of last year. Uh, we'll be also putting some effort into habitat improvement projects. So super busy season is, is just ramping up for those guys. And then finally, um, one last thing really quickly is the last April 1st, last week, we held the conservation permit funding meeting. And it's the meeting that uh, the conservation partners, the sportsman's group come together and they start to contribute money uh, through the conservation permits to habitat projects. Last week they spent, contributed just over $3.1 million and fully or partially funded 93 habitat projects or research 
or things like that. So we are really excited about that. That, that work really helps us along and contributes to the things that are being talked about today. Um, with that, Brock, I don't have anything else unless there's any questions from the RAC. Thank, Thank you, Jason. Jason. Any questions from the RAC for Jason? No, but uh, this is Dan Potts. Hey, I have a comment. You know, uh, those of us who are really aged and decrepit, you know, we we really appreciated uh, Ray Loken and how precious he was as a law enforcement officer. I just want to say, you know, thumbs up to that guy. He, he was incredible. Should have arrested me one time, but he... <laughs> He probably regrets that he did it, and I'm sure he's keeping his eye on you still, Danny. So, <laughs> but we did appreciate Ray. He had a, a great over 30 years with the agency, and he was a, a great sergeant and officer with us. Thank you, Jason. Thanks, Danny. Uh, any other questions for Jason or comments for Jason? Uh, Brock, I've got two. Uh, I see Wes Alexander's on the meeting. So, first of all, congratulations to Wes on the new position. Wes is a great guy. I'm sure he'll do a great job in that new position. Looking forward to working with him there. Uh, also, um, in regards to the uh, conservation permit funding meeting that uh, Jason just referenced last week, if I recall correctly, that meeting was broadcast on YouTube. So I'm assuming, and maybe this is a question for Jason, that that meeting or that YouTube video is probably still out there for people to watch if they wanted to. Uh, Jason, is that accurate? Uh, it's still out there, and people are able to go and find it and, and view it. Cool. Uh, anybody that's interested in seeing how the conservation permit funds are used, uh, that's that's one of my favorite meetings of the year. I'd highly recommend uh, taking a look at that meeting. You can see uh, all the projects are presented by the biologists, and and then you can see the kinds of the, where, where the dollars are being spent. So I, I'm I'm really um, applause to the DWR for for um, publicizing that. Uh, thanks, Ben. That's a great comment because uh, we occasionally get comments from sportsmen saying that the conservation permit pro is a is just a money making scheme for the division, and it's really not. It really goes to fund a whole bunch of important projects. So anybody can go watch that meeting and see where that money goes. Excellent. Yes, for sure. That that meeting has been. I've been participating in that meeting for about ten years now, and and it's. You know, the first time or two I attended, it was eye-opening to see um, the projects and, and where those funds were, were being put. And so it's awesome that, that that's now available for the public to watch. So. Any other comments or questions for Jason? Jason, you know, we've talked a little bit about education in the past and uh, just the need to get information out on the way you guys do things. And I think uh, both this meal deer meeting and that conservation permit meeting, those of being available on YouTube are, those are just excellent educational resources, both for RAC members and for the public in general. I think that goes just a tremendous uh, amount of effort in the right direction for getting your message out there about what's going on. So kudos to you guys for posting that information online. I'm sure this meal deer uh, meeting was a ton of work for your biologists to pull that together right before this meeting. Um, but thank you so much for doing that. That's I think that's spectacular. Thanks, Scott. And, and I'll pass that on. And Kobe and Justin and our biologists and, and Rusty and everybody are on here. And they did spend a lot of time preparing for that. And I'm glad to hear that it's uh, that it, it is being helpful. And you know, maybe without COVID, maybe we wouldn't be where we are now with some of these things. But We've learned a lot and uh, glad that glad to move ahead, continuing to do those types of things and be transparent and be educational as well. Thanks, Jason and Scott. Okay, that brings us to our first agenda item, which is number uh, number five on the agenda: buck permit, buck deer permit recommendations for 2021. Uh, hopefully, everybody got a chance to watch Kobe's presentation. Uh, there will not be a presentation this evening. Um, we'll start with questions from the rack to Kobe. Brock, would it be all right if I, oh. I went through the summary? Yeah, let's stick with the, the order of things, Jason. Thanks for reminding me. First, Jason will provide a summary of the public comments. <laughs> no worries. I've been super excited to, to do this. So. <laughs> 
Um, so I've done two things this go around. Uh, we'll talk about the pie chart that I think each of you saw and was delivered to your email. And then I went in and, and did a, a quick summary of kind of the general themes that were provided in the comments for each of the different topics. So from the pie chart, um, we learned the question was, which best describes your position regarding the buck deer permit recommendations? We had 40% uh, that strongly agreed with recommendations and 20% that somewhat agreed. We had 4% that were neutral, 24% that were strongly disagreed and 12% that somewhat disagreed. Um, going through the comments, we had 31 responses come in for this rack. Um, not all of the responses commented specifically on each one of the topics of the agenda items that we'll go through today. But the most highly commented one was the buck deer permit recommendations and 26 people commented on those. So some of the, the general themes that, that I was able to pull out of, of those comments, um, the, the biggest one was there were a lot of people talking about reducing or cutting buck deer permit numbers. There were 14 comments that spoke specifically to reducing or, or cutting numbers. Um, some of the reasons that were common in there were fewer hunters in the field, improve and restore uh, genetics, and then improve quality of bucks. Another theme uh, was we had several that agreed with recommendations. There were three comments that were appreciative of DWR using and following the data that they've collected. Um, there were three comments where they recommended they wanted to go to a, a, a unit harvest of three point or better. Um, three comments that wanted to close units for some period of time. Uh, to, and primarily that was to, to give another season to let the deer grow and mature. So more of a quality than a, a quantity thing. And then there was uh, some unit specific things that were wrapped up in all of those as well. And they spoke specifically to the Ochre Stansberry, uh, Manti, Wasatch, West Desert, and Fish Lake. Um, so with that, I'll go ahead and turn the time back over to you, Brock. Those were kind of what I pulled out of it. And, and hopefully you were able to, to get some of that information too as you read through the comments when they came in. Thank you, Jason. I would I would comment that there were surprisingly few comments overall. I mean, 24 comments relative to some of the past meetings. To me, that's an indication that maybe most people are okay with what's happening. I don't know if that's true or not, but usually when people are upset, like the, the last meeting, I think we had 130 some comments when people were upset about something that was being recommended. Here we had 24 and usually this is the big meeting of the year when we're talking about bucks and bulls. And so I, I was surprised. I was, I was happy to see that. I will tell everybody. I think everybody on the rack received the letter from SFW. Uh, it came in after the time, so I don't think the division saw it on their website. But SFW is supportive of all the recommendations except one, and they wanted to reduce the number of tags on the Manti. We'll talk about that in a minute. But but anybody have questions for Kobe regarding the deer buck permit recommendations? Well, I do, so I guess I'll go ahead. <laughs> Let's go, Mike. So I watched the division's presentation um, to the Wildlife Board last week, and I thought it was excellent. I would encourage every RAC member to uh, to watch that, uh, to educate themselves. I thought it was, the division did an excellent job. One one unit that stood, get, stuck out in my mind through that presentation, though, um, was the CAMAS unit. So with the proposed 500 permit decrease this year, the CAMAS unit will have had 1,000 permits decreased over the last two years. And um, it looks like the fawn to doe ratio and the survivability was high. Um, that was mentioned that the unit is trending up in population. Um, and they said that and correct me if I'm wrong, but it said that the buck to doe ratio is projected to be 23 bucks to 
doe, 100 does um, post-season, but the unit's supposed to be managed on an 18 to 20 level. Why are we cutting an additional 500 permits out of that unit? Okay, so uh, Mike, the and, and you know there's there's an art and a science to this. The cat machine is a little harder because there's a lot of private ground, right? Where if you don't have access to, you can't hunt. Mm -hmm. um, the cut here, it, it really could come in somewhere between eighteen and twenty three. That's a fair comment. Um, it's, it's kind of a wide gap, but under the recommendation. Uh, it just depends on what harvest success. I'm looking over the last five years um, at high success and low success. Uh, this rec was a moderated ro moderated recommendation by the region that could come in a little high, or it, if it's higher success, it would come in at the bottom end of the recommendation as well, uh, of the bottom end of the buck ratio as well. And I, I mean, that's the rationale behind it. Uh, it, it's just there's a little bit of a window there. They tried to make a good wreck. I I can see both sides. This a lot of a lot of private ground, hard to access, and during the hunting season, um, definitely less deer available on public ground. Now, I don't know if that's a good reason to make the cut, because there are people, our folks that have access to to the private ground, and um, and they get their permits cut as well when when we make a cut. That's the rationale behind the cut. Under higher success, we'd be at the very bottom end um, of, of the okay. prediction. All right, thanks, Kobe. Yep. Other questions for Kobe? I have, I have a question about the uh, permit allocations. There was a comment that came in that um, that commented on the uh, uh, limited number of hams permits. So there was 15 total. And, and I, I thought it was an interesting comment and I hadn't thought about it. And so I wonder, Kobe, if you can speak to that. Why are there so few hams permits being offered? Uh, can, I, can I say one more thing on Mike, Mike's comment first, Mike, if you're okay with that? And that is just, Mike, that's a, it's a very conservative recommendation. I just want to acknowledge that. And is there opportunity for some more there? Probably. I just, full disclosure. Um, okay, so the hams permits. Yeah, that one, it's, now you're speaking hams deer. It's because we agreed to keep those very, very minimalized for the first few years. So this is the second year. And when we brought those through, we said we'd have those hunts and we'd have them at a very low number for the first, first three years. And so, and see how the public reacted, how they fit in, uh, what success rates look like. And so this is just year two of three, and it's just something we agreed to. Thank you, Kobe. Uh, there's probably room for more. Uh, and we wanna keep our word. Actually, I appreciate that answer, Kobe. On, on both of those, on my question and on Josh's. Um, Really quick, uh, and this kind of goes along with the buck permit recommendations, but maybe not as much, but we, we did, and so maybe this isn't the appropriate time to talk about it, but uh, we did get some feedback on the West Desert units and how they're not counted and how we don't have real data to, to, to support what we're doing out there. I received emails um, about that directly. I don't know if other RAC members did, but... Uh, is it, what's the division's stance on that, or is that something you'd rather talk about at another point in time? No, I, I, I can answer that. And I'll probably kick it to the region too to make sure that I say it adequately. Um, at the end of the day, on the West Desert, we're talking bucks. And I understand that, that um, we don't have all the data that we have on typical units on the West Desert. And the reason why is because deer are so sparse out there and to collect those data um, is very expensive if we and, and and it wouldn't change management so we've asked ourselves if we have the resources to do that should we spend those resources there 
and we could not there if there's a, a serious frustration or, um, but we know that we're not having a biological impact with buck hunting out there we watch harvest rates pretty quickly uh, we we have some migration info that, that we've seen from those areas um, and we don't have solid buck door issues on those areas uh, it, it's a it's a resources issue honestly so the way to collect those data would be through helicopter and we could spend fifty to seventy thousand dollars collecting those data or we could spend it on making things better for deer and we've chosen to spend it on habitat and other things to make things better for deer for weekend. Kobe isn't it also true that a lot of those deer that are that are there the hunt that are there during classification are not there during the hunting season? Yeah, that's a good point too, Brock. The West Desert, so you have those deer that are all across the West Desert out up to and onto the deep creeks, but then you have deer that migrate off to Vernon and they'll go miles and miles into the West Desert. Um, and so when you hit November, the data probably isn't the best to represent what's there anyway. That's an additional point. Thanks, Brock. Sorry. I think that's a actually a really good response. I I really wanted to ask that so people could watch this meeting and and get an answer. Other questions for Kobe? Brock, I've got one. Yeah. Uh, Kobe, talk to me about the uh, Pine Valley unit. I, um, I, I bring this one up because I'm look I'm looking at the data here and. And our buck to doe ratio, all three years and the average is, is above objective. We're looking at a 400 permit cut there. Um, and and I, I know you and I have talked about this. I'd like to hear some more information about it. But one of my biggest concerns here is the Pine Valley traditionally has been a difficult unit to raise tags on. And so it just bites a little bit now that we're gonna cut tags there, especially when the numbers contradict that cut. So so con convince me this is the right thing. Well, Ben, I'll do my best. So <laughs> at, at the end of the day, Ben, everything you said is correct. So the one thing that we, we agreed to do in this new mule deer plan is take into account what's coming into the system through yearling bucks. And this is just a story of reduced fawn, reduced fawn doe ratios. So the Pine Valley came in this last year. I'm just pulling up the data right here. As I'm talking about. Um, it came in this last year at 45 fawns per 100 does. Now it's, it's bounced all over the place, but typically it's kind of held at about, at about that 60. Right, we're in the high 50s, 60 fonts per 100 does. And when you drop down and lose 15 fonts per 100 does, that makes a big difference on what's coming in that next year. The rationale behind this, we're estimating we're going to have, you know, 60% fawn survival. But the rationale behind this recommendation is simply lower fawn doe ratios, fewer yearling bucks coming into the system. And under using those data, it's a good rack. Now, I understand the fact that it's hard to swallow. It is, a, it is a fight to always try to manage to the plan. It's a large public unit that should offer a lot of opportunity. It's general to good. And I, I can commit that we'll make the rec to go back up if, if the data is there to do it. Um, but uh, long story short, this is a recommendation that manages to the plan using the additional data that we put into it in 2019. Okay, thanks for that, Kobe. I, I really like the proactive approach. I, I do, I, and I applaud you guys there. And, and I appreciate that commitment to recommend the increase when it's warranted. So thank you. Kobe, can I ask a, just a quick point of clarification? So. Go ahead, Josh. So when. Um, when, when these like numbers are set in the management plan, say it's an 18 to 20, you know, per hundred or 15 to 17, or, you know, an elk like seven and a half to eight and a half, 
do you, do you try to hit like the middle of that objective or, or maybe just walk us through like, are you trying to hit 18 to like satisfy it or get it down to 20 or maybe just talk us through like the, the, the biology behind that. Cause I, I think that might help answer like, you know, Mike's question on the Camus or Ben's question on the Pine, Pine Valley. Um, Cause I'm, I'm just curious. <laughs> that, that's actually a really good, really good question. Um, on limited entry, where there's a larger window, we absolutely aim for the middle. You know, we, we manage 25 to 35, we aim for 30 um, and try to make recommendations to come in there. When we talk about general season, we manage for such a small window. Um, you know, if our rec can get it in the window every time, we're batting a thousand, that's pretty good. So at the end of the day, we, we look at success rates, what's typically been harvested. We look at the number of deer on the landscape, look at the number of bucks on the landscape and say, okay, under these different success rates, where are we going to come in? And there could be a pretty big gap between a high success year and a low success year. Also, uh, the other factors to take into account are if there's fewer deer on the landscape, you're probably going to lean towards that low success. And so look at timing of the hunt, look at number of deer on the landscape, number of bucks available to harvest, take all those things into consideration and say, okay, it could come in between moderate and high. It could come in between moderate and low. Uh, given these circumstances, you know, this year we've got a late hunt. And so you have to look at those units. Success changes when we hunt deer through the end of October. And so we have to look at those units and say, there's a chance, even though we have fewer deer in the landscape, we could have a little higher harvest this year. So I don't know if that completely answers your question, because you're looking at a gap that between low and moderate success might be a difference of 18 to 23. And and so you, you you've got to see where that's going to come in and, and we do our best you know we use the data because that's what we have and it's better than opinions right like i said at the, the work session if we're going to go with opinion let's just go with mine because i think my ideas are the best um, but it, it's still it's the best we have in wildlife management and it's more data than than any state in the west uses that, that's super helpful actually thank, thank you, you. Other questions for Kobe? Yeah, I've got one, Kobe. Um, so you alluded to this on the West Desert in discussing that later in the year, you get migrating deer that move on to that unit. So on units where we have a larger proportion of private property or CWMUs, um, when we're doing counts later in the fall, I think the assumption is, or the presumption is from a lot of people that uh, buck to doe ratios on private land or maybe on a CWMU are higher than they are on the public land, maybe, maybe considerably higher. But if we're counting after those deer moved off the private on the public, or um, it's almost like you have two different units on a single unit. Do we have any way of counting for that? Or do we just get an average and call it good? Oh, Scott, that's a really good question. Um... What it comes down to is that, you know, there, there are units, as, as we hit, I kind of divide this in my mind. I was going to divide it north and south. We get down to about the nine mile. And that's the last largely private land dominated unit. Um, and then as we come off that uh, in the southern southeastern Utah, we have a few parcels of private, but it's not the same. When we did that in the plan, the one thing I want to mention is that we said we will manage to the buck doe ratios. And then we exempted ourselves from private land units, private land dominated units, because it doesn't matter how many permits we throw at some of those, we're going to be above the ratio that we've agreed to manage to. And it's because if you don't have access or if it is a CWMU, you do have higher buck doe ratios. Uh, the long answer is we take them into account. We know that we have enough bucks to breed all the does and buck doe ratios are definitely higher on private land than they're on public land. And some of those bucks spill off. Some of them become available. Some they don't, some of them don't live super tight to the boundaries, or they come off the boundary and they they become available. But it's it's something that's really really hard to account for, and that's why we exempted ourselves from managing to the buck doe ratio on a unit that's dominated by private land. Uh, and a lot of those are above the management objective. Um, it's not a population issue, as you well know. 
and and we want to sell a, an opportunity to harvest a buck uh, and not something that's just you know in name only a deer permit we want an opportunity for a hunter so we do our best to moderate some of that and these issues are really really tough i don't have a better answer than that i wish i did yeah it seems like a real aggressive program to try to gain access to for, for hunters on private lands is really the key to that yeah and and um hunting has become a really desired activity that is um a lot of people want to do and and um and if you have private property you also have the concerns of who do i let on with a gun and it, Absolutely. it's a hard thing to walk yeah Thanks, Kobe. More questions? Yeah, Kobe. So this is Dan Potts again. Hey, so, uh, you know, the, the problem that we seem to have about every decade, right, <laughs> is that we get these catastrophic snowstorms, like, and, 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 you know, and so last year was almost classic. Uh, in the area that I hunted all my life, uh, I was afraid to go up draws because I was afraid that I'd find all these young doe and, and, and fawn deer laying dead. So that area, backside of the Wasatch, basically, uh, that area has succumbed to that same kind of catastrophic mortality every single time that happens. And drop the, the herd drops by, you know, 25, 30 percent. Oh, my God. So what are you guys doing to, and it's a private, that's why we segued into this discussion, because, you know, it's, it, it's the issue of all those private property owners and access, you know, from the, you know, the public to adequately control, you know, I mean, you look at the permits for the East Canyon, what is it, Chalk Creek, and oh my God, those numbers are huge. And, and that's because we, we, we struggle with this boom and bust issue, right, Kobe? So could you just briefly address what you might, be trying to do to, to try to deal with those, all this private property issues? Sure, Danny, I, I am honestly not sure I completely understand the question. Um, and I don't wanna get off on a tangent. So you're gonna to have to help me a little more. No, 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 it, it, I, it's not too much of a tangent. It's just, is the division working uh, with these, uh, you know, it, it's gonna be a continual problem for forever. You know, the interaction between private property owners and the division uh, to adequately harvest animals so they don't boom and then in a bad snowstorm bust. That's yeah, all. Okay, okay. Are we working with private landowners to help manage populations? Um, and the answer is that is one of the things that our CDMU program could very well. Now, doe harvest in our state is, has been very difficult. The new plan talks about moderating populations so that our booms aren't as big and then our busts aren't as low. Um, and we're, we're working to do this. Right now, we're, we're at a bust, right? Right now, we're, we're down low. We're working to grow deer. We know we can have more deer on the landscape. And as recently as five years ago, four years ago, we had 60,000 plus more deer on the landscape. Um, so we, we can work through that and there are some good programs to work with private landowners to do that. Uh, and and you can see, I when, the next time we're in a position where we grow a lot of deer, we're doing a lot of work to grow deer, a lot of habitat work, a lot of predator control. When the climate conditions line up right, we're set up to grow deer, right? Um, and when we do grow, hopefully we can offer some of that harvest to our sportsmen on private land, help manage these populations and help moderate the crash because that's what deer do. Um, we all, we all forget that the deer, uh, deer, deer cycle, you know, they, they grow, they fall off. Um, and we've seen it for decades. It, it's, it's hard when you're down in the trough and trying to climb back out. Um, we know we will, um, and probably better next time. I'm gonna steal a line from Justin. We know what to do when deer are down. We know how to work to grow deer. What we struggle to do is manage deer when they're growing, right? When they're growing, everybody's happy. We see them growing a lot more and more and more. And we need to work to take that top off before they peak and then head back down again. That would be the best wildlife management. Um, and we'll keep trying to do that.
Right, and and that's my point, Kobe. That it's that it's that top side and heading down the back side. You know, <laughs> trying try to get ahead of that curve is just so hard for you guys, and I just really feel for you. But uh, that conti- that will continue in northern Utah, especially. That's going to continue to be a a serious problem with with this uh, global warming issue and some of these other concerns, right? Other questions for Kobe? Hearing none, I uh, guess I turn, go I, ahead. Go I've ahead. got one more, sorry, Brock. Um, yeah, Kobe, we had a, a recommendation from SFW to consider a cut on the Central Mountains Manti, and I'm looking at the numbers, it looks like the recommendation is status quo wonder if you could just talk to that for a minute. They're looking for a 600 permit cut. I I could speak to that. And the regions here, really, I feel like I'm taking all the time. Wes is super excited to speak, and and Rusty's here as well. So let's let them take some of these. That's a great one for the region. Yeah, that'd be great. Let's let's hear from Wes. Hey, Kobe. Hey, Can you hear me? Sorry. You're yes, good. sir. Yep. Um, so ultimately, I mean, we, as as you all know, we managed through the plan. Um, uh, the Manti is at 15 to 17. Um, managed at 15 to 17 bucks per hundred dollars. I mean, the three-year average there, we're sitting at, at 16.2. Um, uh, that last year's alone, we were at 15.5. We were in the parameters for the buck to I know there's a lot of concern with southern portion of the unit having a lower buck to doe ratio um, than the northern portion. We counted a lot of deer on on the south portion of the unit. Um, again, a lot of this came from the southeast region. We worked jointly with them, um, but ultimately within the plan, um, yeah, I think the I think south, south portion, portion we were, were at, the, the numbers were a little lower, but overall we counted, we counted a lot of deer, deer on the south, south and still, still came, came within in, in that 15 to 17, 17 range. So ultimately recommending to, to stay where we're at. Okay, thanks Wes. Hey, How's uh, that? go ahead. Oh, I just gonna say, how's that uh, herd doing population wise and drought wise, like overall population? Uh, do you know the the our phone numbers were right off, Kobe? I'm sorry, I don't have that in I, front of me. I can, yeah, I can get some of that really quick. They're fifty eight. They are fifty eight fawns per hundred does, I believe. Yeah. So the answer there, though, is really that. There's this weird phenomenon around the center of the state where they don't have the heavy, heavy winters that the north has, and they don't have this extreme drought that the south has. And so they've fared these last four or five years a lot better than the rest of the state. Now, um, that doesn't mean they, they've done great. They haven't grown, but they haven't lost a ton of deer either. It's, it's been pretty moderated over the last few years. The fond de doe ratio is the highest it's been since 2012, I believe. Wow. High fond de doe ratio. Sur- survival hasn't been as, on fawns hasn't been as, it's not been bad, I guess, but it's all right. Been- well, I looked up all these data after we got this recommendation from SFW. So far, adult survival is 94% on the north and 100% on the south. We haven't lost a single color deer on the south end of the unit. Uh, survive, fond, de do, fond survival is 58%. Um, Wes was right. The south part of the unit had a buck to doe ratio of 13.2, and the north end had a buck to doe ratio of 18.8. And so the north is about as much above the, the objective as the south is below. But I would, I would also say that a lot of the deer from the south winter in the north. So when classification happens, 
the north biologists are classifying some of the south deer. Brock, I would just add, can you guys hear me okay? Yeah. I, I would just add, uh, there's some localized, really cool things going on in the Manti. The north, the northwest Manti, we were almost at 80 fawns per 100 doe this year, which is just unreal. Um, and the other thing is we only classify the way that that the 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 regions kind of or the the different sectors of the Manti line up, but we don't actually have a lot of the Northwest Manti that we classify. The bulk of our classification is the Southwest Manti. And so we're, we might get two or 300 deer on the Northwest Manti, but we get 15 or 1800 on the Southwest Manti. So uh, the bulk of our numbers, our classification is on the, the South Manti. And the other thing I'd say, Brock is, is uh, you know, or, Sorry, whoever asked the question, Ben. Uh, we know what the problem is on the on the South Manti, and and I don't think it's buck permits. Um, we're trying to tackle the problem with with being very uh, very aggressive with cougar harvest, and and we think that'll that'll bring things back um, quicker than anything. And so I'll just I'll just leave you with that 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 I, I guess you know if you go back to science 101. You're only supposed to manipulate one independent variable at a time so you can really get a feel for what's going on. And right now we're manipulating the, the predator side of things. And if you start tweaking too many pieces at once, it, it might get kind of convoluted. But I think right now where we're getting after cougars, and, and it's not, again, it's not, a, it's not a buck permit problem, it's a cougar problem. Okay, Th thanks for that, guys. That's, I appreciate that, it's been super helpful. Um, just looking at the numbers, Recommendations for 8,100 permits on that on that unit, and as I look through these numbers, that's, there's two other units that offer that many permits. So this is one of three units in the state that are offering the highest number of permits in the state, um, and all the numbers seem to line up. And, I, and I'm, I'm speculating here a little bit that probably the um, the concern with from SFW is probably localized to that southern portion of the unit, and so. I, I think with this conversation, all that data, I'm I'm comfortable with the division's recommendations there. So thank you, guys. Thanks, Ben. Any other questions for Kobe or Rusty or Wes or Jason or? <laughs> yep, maybe just a quick comment, Kobe. As you talk about this, and we. We struggle to understand this cycle of, of deer populations. Um, maybe just from an educational perspective, at some future point, it, it might be kind of fun to to do a little presentation and talk about different species and their RK strategies. You know, pick rabbits and pick elephants, and just talk about the stability of those populations and put mule deer on the line between them. And I think it'll help us understand biologically where deer are at compared to a lot of other animals, and maybe give us a little better perspective. I actually think that's a that's a great idea, Scott. Honestly, to to go go through that with different species and say, okay, this is this is how rabbits behave. This is how deer behave. This is how. When, when you look at you a ninety five percent mortality in rabbits, and you see ten percent deer, you think, well, deer are actually pretty stable compared. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Well, and then you go to elk, and elk are a little more stable than deer. Right. And so it's it's yeah. There's some good examples we could use. Scott, this is Potts. Hey, uh, that sounds like a perfect uh, little presentation at a rack training. Yes. Okay, I'll turn it over to the rack for discussion. So I, I want to say kudos to the folks, public folks who took the time to make comments and send comments in. Um, I think that's always great. Uh, I hope a lot of people watched that prior board meeting and really got educated. I think some of the comments that were made, if those folks watched that meeting, have really helped their understanding as well. Um, I'm personally, I'm totally fine with the recommendations as they're presented, and I'm willing to support that. Uh, and I actually, I agree with Scott. 
Uh, one of the common comments was we need to let these herds become healthy again. And in my opinion, buck harvest has very little to do with herd health. You never talk to a rancher that says, uh, I don't have enough bulls in my pasture with my cows. I, they usually have like one bull for 25 cows and they never say I need 10 bulls for my 25 cows to have a healthy herd. That's just bulls eating food that the deer can have, that the cows can have. Yeah, I'll just add, I, uh, <clears throat> I always hate to see permit reductions because I think it takes away from opportunity, but I know the, I mean, just in viewing the uh, presentations and, you know, being part of the conversation, I feel like they're warranted this time around. I just hope that when the herd rebounds, like, like the rabbits ultimately do, um, that, that, that people are going to be amenable to a raise in increases because I feel like when you look at the trend for the past 10 years, we've had a few solid years and it's been, it's, a, it's been a blip down. And so I just, I can support these recommendations as is. I, I just hope the same is true when, when there's an increase on the, on the back end. Yeah, that's, that's also my biggest fear with cutting. I I'm all for cutting tags. If it helps the resource, um, I appreciate all the work the, biologists have done to to bring us these numbers this is literally the most information we've ever had to base an, our opinion on on the numbers of permits and i for one really appreciate it um the only one that gives me a little bit of heartburn is camas just because it the it's the only one it's trending up it's the buck to doe ratio is high it's but i i'm not well versed enough um in that unit to uh to go against the biologist recommendations. So, um, and then on the SFW proposal, I, I, I tend to um, agree with what's been said here tonight. Um, I, I, I know that there are concerns with um, small canyons. I liked how Kobe uh, talked about that in presentation he gave to the board um, about, you know, we can't just manage on one person snapshot in one canyon. We have to look at the unit as a whole um, and so uh, I probably would just go along with the division's recommendations um, and uh, and let the Northern Region RAC address CAMAS because they know more about it than I do. So actually, Mike, I just looked and, and CAMAS is not drifting up. Their population is, but the buck to doe ratio has gone from 24 to 20 to 19. So it is trending down. Yeah, yeah, and they, but but that also when they took in the the doe to fawn ratio, I mean, there it, it kind of was the same as the manti where we got a good number of fawns coming into the herd. And like Kobe said, it's it's it is a conservative number based on the, the data. But I do agree that the the bucks uh, numbers have come down a little bit, which might be part of the that mid season hunt. So maybe some more data that needs to be obtained. Any other discussion? Have we, adequ have we adequately addressed the public comments? I didn't feel like there was a consensus of comments on any particular unit that caught my attention. I think the ones that uh, we've discussed so far were most of the ones that had credence to my mind. So I'm, I'm comfortable moving on. So, and I am too. I mean, the other comment that was that we got multiples of, we want a better quality hunt, more mature deer, but to me that should be addressed in the mule deer management plan, not, I mean, these guys, the biologists are trying to manage to that plan now. That's not, that's not, and 67% of the hunters surveyed wanted equal or more opportunity that we currently have when we came up with that meal deer management plan. Yeah, I think if we go back and look at that survey we got, you know, the, the majority of folks wanted things kind of status quo, don't reduce opportunity for more quality. But the second right. highest second highest group was, let's increase quality at the expense of opportunity. Yeah. So to yeah. see that result in the, you know, these, these data is exactly what I would expect. Yeah, I agree. 
Yeah, my perspective on the public comment is um, if there was a consensus, it was support for the tag reductions as presented, and if anything, support for even further cuts, uh, which I, I wouldn't support. I, I want to leave as much opportunity on the table as possible. Um, so I, I think I think we've addressed the public comments pretty well. I, I have a tendency to, to agree with Ben on that. Uh, there was a lot of push to cut tags even further, so I think we're okay. Hearing these comments, I would entertain a motion. I'll make a motion that we accept the buck deer permit recommendations as presented. I'll second that. I'm writing it down. Excellent. Any discussion on the motion? I'll call a vote. Uh, AJ. Ben Louder. Yes. Chris Schmitz. Yes. Danny Potts. Yeah, hi. Eric Reed. Yes. Josh Leonard. Yes. Ken Strong. Yes. Uh, Luke Decker. Mike Christensen. Yes. Scott Jensen. Yes. yes. And Steve Lund, who's not here. Passes unanimously with a vote of eight to zero. Excellent. Thank you, everyone. Next item on the agenda is item number six, uh, bull elk and buck pronghorn permit recommendations for 2021. Again, you all had an opportunity to watch this. Um, I'll turn the time over to Jason for a summary of the public comments. All right, thanks, Brock. Uh, so the question asked on this was, uh, which best describes your position regarding the bull elk and pronghorn permit recommendations? We had 29% that strongly agreed with the recommendations and 14 that somewhat agreed. We had 14% that were neutral or, or neither agree nor disagree. 7% somewhat agree and 36% strongly, or, sorry, somewhat disagree. Hopefully I said that right. And 36% that strongly disagree. So as I look through this as well, some of the themes there were similar in some ways to the to the buck deer permits um, they wanted to see more reductions or cut the bull elk permits for multiple reasons again fewer hunters in the field and, and wanted larger bulls um, and there were five comments that wanted reductions or to cut the permits um, conversely there were two comments that wanted wanted actually more bull permits and those were specifically identified on the Manti and the Nebo to offer more permits on those units. Um, we had one comment that agreed with the recommendations and again, appreciated DWR following the data. And then a couple of the unit specific recommendations or, or comments came in on the Book Cliffs, the Fish Lake, the Manti and the Nebo. That's what I have for the, the bucket, elk and pronghorn. Thank you, Jason. Uh, questions for Kobe from the rack. Kobe, could you review the history on the book cliffs when we started the spike hunt out there? Uh, I know there was some discussion about changing the age unit objective. I don't think that passed the wildlife board last time. And just give us a little his historical review on that unit. Yeah, I, I think the book cliff spike hunt, uh, I don't want to get this wrong, Scott, but it, it's, it's been going on about 10 years. Um, it was one of the later units we brought on. And Justin, if I'm, if I'm wrong on that, Justin or Kent, you can provide more insight, please jump in. Um, what, what were, and, and Justin just turned on it. Uh, what we're really seeing on the book list, so not to divert the question, but it's it's a it's a recruitment issue, um, and what it 
appears to be is that that population is nutritionally limited and reproduction has slowed way, way down. So one of the interesting things, when we looked at our average age of harvest on cows out there in the roadless, we're harvesting 10 year old cows wow. on, on average. When we looked at our average age of harvest and the rest of it, we're still three and four years above. When we compared it to other units across the state, that whole population has shifted to where they're older they're not recruiting as many young, and it's, it's an issue of too many mouths on the landscape. So from a biological, purely biological perspective, probably the best thing that we ever started out there was the spy cut. And create maybe a little bit of room. Um, overall, though, we're going to have to look at what is the appropriate number of elk to have on the book list. How do we make that population more productive, how do we increase the number of calves? You know, when we went back out there, three years ago, we went out, we caught elk. Three years ago, pregnancy rates were in the 50%, 50 percent, 50 40. In the 40, okay. Uh, last I year, think it was 53, back, probably. 53. Last year, we went back out, um, we caught elk again, and we were up 86%, which is good. That's what we look at statewide. We had a wetter year. This year, we went back out again, dropped down into the 50s again. And none of the cows that carried a fawn this last, or none of the cows that carried a calf this last year were pregnant again this year. And so it's an issue of probably two things, age, and it's a function of habitat quality or body condition. Skinny cows, not getting pregnant every year, they're old, they're nutritionally deficient, and it's probably pushing that back down to the appropriate number to where they're more productive, they're younger, they have space on the landscape for calves, and the population's a little more resilient. Right now it's not even as it should be. That didn't answer all the questions about the spy cut, but it kind of gave some history on the booklet, so at least what we're seeing in the data. You know, we're seeing it's a nutritional issue, probably too many elk. Now we did ask that the roadless area, we did ask that we lowered the age objective in the roadless because they're the same elk. And managing for a higher age objective in the roadless will require significant cuts. And, and we've always said an elk, we try to keep that number around 20 to get good age data, get everything. Um, and there was a strong message that by the board that they wanted us to try and manage to the older age objective in the roadless. So to do that, we cut the ribs. Yeah. You, you, did a good job of, you did a good job of answering the question that should have been asked. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Thanks. I, I tried. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for seeing through my question. <laughs> and then, Scott, just for your knowledge, we started hunting spikes statewide in 2009. So it's had okay. 12 spike cons out on the book plus this will be the third day. And, and so the book was, oh, just, in terms of, just in terms of recruiting more bulls into that population, it, it's a challenge if they're the same elk in the you know, adjacent units. Um, I guess I'm just wondering about if we remove the spike hunt from that unit and have a higher cow harvest, would that accomplish the better recruitment or more recruitment of bulls in there? And by re increasing harvest, cow harvest, you might remove numbers on the landscape. Is that a reasonable strategy or is that not really in line with what might work well? No, I think it's a reasonable strategy. I think the, the concept is, uh, you know, we need to push that population down and we can do that through cows. Um, but I, I think if you do that, you're wasting out on the opportunity to hunt spikes. And, and that's what I would say. There are a lot of spike hunters on the book list as well as limited entry bull hunters. And we're trying to, we're trying to manage elk for bulls. And it, it'll work if we can push that population back a little bit. And I guess the reduced quality that you're seeing on the book list is from the reduced habitat quality. You know, you're, you're ending up with smaller bulls. You're ending up with fewer elk calves um, and we can have both we just got to 
be realistic about how many elk we can have out there. Okay, thank you. Kobe, I want to ask the same question in a different way. So it seems like if nutritional value is the limiting factor, um, I can't recall what the antlerless um, recommendation was for cows. And I also can't recall off the top of my mind what Riley's recommendation is for uh, buff on the book cliffs. But I know overall buffalo was, was an increased permit. So, I mean, by increasing once in a lifetime buffalo and cow and uh, antlerous elk, like, does that kind of get us to, 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 to where we need to be in terms of hunting, hunting more, more elk in that unit than, than we currently are, are going to be doing in 2021, apparently? The, the, the shorter answer is, is we're taking a step in the right direction. We took a significant increase in, in elk, for sure. Um, and, and bison, we've hammered, uh, hammered the wrong word. We've removed a lot of bison on the book list the last couple of years trying to account for range conditions and other things that are going on. And um, and we're still going to harvest what, what we can and still have a good, robust population out there. But yeah, we're, we're taking a step in the right direction. With wildlife management, it doesn't change overnight a lot of times. Um, but we're going to work towards having that appropriate number of elk out there. Kobe, on, on the book cliffs, do you, uh, do you know what the harvest data is on like the muzzleloader spike hunt and maybe towards the end of the of the spike hunt the latter part of the general season any weapon hunt yeah can't can you grab harvest data for me is that all right and then um at the end of the day mike remember that the board shortened the book cliff hunt it's only five days long uh this year and i'm not sure exactly what kind of impact that'll have a lot of times when we see shorter hunts we just see more pressure at the first of the hunt. Um, and I'm not sure what the result will be. I, w I wasn't aware. I, w I wasn't aware they, or I didn't remember that they had shortened that. So that's what my question was getting at. So you're good. You're good, Kent. Okay. Okay. Um, um, yeah. Yeah. But if you're, if you're trying to make room, it, it's okay to remove some bulls. We're so bull heavy on so many of these units, in, including the book list. It just comes down to we're not seeing some of the quality that we'd like to see, and, and we'd like to have more productive herds. It's okay probably to remove both. Push that population back a little bit, get a more reproductive herd, a more resilient herd, and better off for everybody. Or we could have it rain more and have another good fire. So that's another possibility. And if somebody can do that, kudos. I'll add to Kobe. I'll add to Kobe. The condition of we know the cows out there in bad condition. The condition of mother when she's pregnant, when she's pregnant accounts for 30, accounts for 30 inches of the bull's, of potential, the bull's potential antler growth. Antler growth. Awesome. Any other questions for Kobe? Yeah, I've got one. Uh, oh. Kobe, Southwest oh, Desert. Um, am I good? All right. Yeah, uh, Southwest Desert. Um, age, average age is above the objective. We're looking at a 16 permit reduction in the recommendation. I understand that we split some of that unit off uh this last fall but my understanding was that was the portion of the unit that wasn't really being hunted anyway so i'm just wondering if we really need this cut uh, it's it's a conservative recommendation uh we split out the north portion of the unit we added 16 permits to that portion of the unit and we we reduced the the rest of the unit by 16 permits um maybe it's too conservative uh at the end, we'll know next year where we're at on, on on age. If it is, we'll be able to increase those permits. Okay, so if we run with the recommendation over a year or two, it'll it'll iron itself out. Is what I'm hearing. Yeah, it should absolutely. And I understand the rationale behind the recommendation. It was 
we removed a portion of the unit. We, we added 16 permits and they pulled them out of the Indian Peaks. You know, the other part of that is too, that population, that, I know that we're talking bull hunting now, not populations, but there are obviously fewer animals on the landscape if they're, and, and we, it's, we've really hit that hard. There's fewer elk out there than there have been in the past. Um, and so it'll be interesting to see what okay. that age objective does. Um, okay, thanks. Yeah, Colby, uh, let's talk about antelope for a minute since it's on the same question. Uh, we shut down the, the Parker, the plateau down there. Uh, I hope we learn, I hope we learn from the fact that we we took too many antelope off that when we were transplanting, but what's the prognosis for down there? What's what's going to happen? Uh, and what about the rest of the state where we're losing, we seem to be losing antelope, and yet they've always seemed to be doing good. Ken, we, we've had a lot of new populations of pronghorn pop up across the state, and, and <laughs> a lot of them are doing really well. You know, so you have pronghorn in places where we haven't had pronghorn before, and and that's a good thing, you know, it's, it's exciting to see. And they've expanded naturally on their own. Um, if you remember back the history of what happened on the Parker, um, we made some recommendations primarily for doe harvest. Um, and then there, there was some conflict and some uh, changes to those recommendations in the rack. And it led to a lot of permits on the Parker for a few years. Now, I don't, I don't think this was, I personally don't feel like this was due to transplanting pronghorn off to Parker. Um, I think it was due to a lot of pressure and a lot of increased doe harvest. Um, and along with that pressure, kind of changing the habits of those pronghorn. We've got pronghorn now that live in the trees. And so we'll see them at certain times of the year, we'll see them on the flights. And then we come around to hunting season and they are hard to find. And there are fewer of them there. Uh, that's another part. So. We cut a donut hole out. We took the plateau completely out of the hunt unit. We said, all right, we'll hunt the surrounding areas and push those back on and create a safe space for them. So I guess the future is through wildlife management, through harvesting around and alleviating some of that pressure, we intend to grow those animals again on the Parker. Uh, it's awesome place for pronghorn. Super excited to have a place like that in Utah and, and we want those animals back. So that's what we intend to do and, and let them go for a few years. Other questions for Kobe? Hearing none, I'd open it just for discussion among the RAC members. I just wanted to say that I really applaud the division for um, their book cliffs, roadless recommendations. And they were forced their hand to, to manage to a, a really tough objective. And to do that, it's gonna be painful. And I think that that was actually a courageous move by the division to do that. Um, and I think if the wildlife board goes against the division's uh, recommendations this year on that particular unit, um, they're just setting up the division for failure. They're, they're, they're throwing their biologists under the bus. And, um, you know, it's the, the only way to try to get to where the board has directed them to be is to make such drastic cuts. And I got a few emails about, you know, that, that it's funny, the people that emailed last year not wanting to lower the age objective are the ones that are emailing this, this time of year to, to, uh, to, to not cut so many permits, but uh, I, I think the division's done a really good job with their permit recommendations this year. I think looking over some of the antelope, um, you know, numbers, just going off numbers is all I see. It, it, it appears that some of them are, are really good and others are don't, don't make any sense to me, but maybe we can have that discussion for another day, how, you know, some of the age of, the three-year averages are very high and they're not giving out any permits there. But there again, I don't know enough about the populations to, to, to go over those, but I think the division did a really good job. Hmm. 
I would I'd say I would like to see a presentation on how they came up with the the proposed numbers like they gave us on deer last week or two weeks ago. I would I would love Careful. something like that. Their workload's gonna get real busy this morning, this next March, I can tell. <laughs> well, I don't think we're having another we're working week anymore, man. That was a lot of work. We're gonna start expecting a lot of stuff anymore. It, it was very educational though. Do you have welcome, a comment? To, welcome to post-COVID life. <laughs> No, no, I mean, I, I, I want to echo Mike's comment. Like, uh, we, we've had more information this time around than I can ever remember. And, and I feel like, you know, having sat on the last Mule Deer Committee, I mean, I want to revisit the question of bucks to doe on the landscape. I mean, why is an 18 to 20 versus a 15 to 17 versus a 40 to 55 unit set? Like, I, th I think that question is, is kind of fundamental to how these permits are being set. And I feel like that that broader question needs to be asked. But I, I again, I, I commend the division because I think I think this is more information that I've ever had in you know four plus years of sitting on the rack and all that. So thank you. Yeah, and I will echo that. This plots again. Uh, you know, the the one thing that has really hurt the division over the many. Uh, decades has, has been not giving the public, especially the public, enough information. And I, I, and I know the use of like CAPTCHA's logo, Mac, you know, talking over people's heads causes a lot of consternation. But I think the division has been doing a better and better job of educating not just the people on the racks and etc., but also the people in the public. And I think the more you focus on on so that they don't, so that they understand that uh, a three point restriction, <laughs> we've been there, we've done that, it don't work. So, <laughs> so, you know, if they understand why these things don't work and how things do work biologically and, and, and socially too, uh, Kobe, I, I think that, uh, you know, we, we can make huge strides forward. And I'm, I'm just, I, 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 I agree with Josh. And, and, Brock, if it's okay, I'd just like to say uh, something too, and that is that we are, we are working to be more transparent, to provide more data, to show more of what happens in the process. We're always working to do that. And I, I appreciate the racks pushing on us, honestly, and saying, we need more. We need more to understand what the thought process is behind these recommendations. And we'll continue to do that. You know, we're working on some great things. Uh, a database that will hopefully provide more information to the public um, and, and, and more uh, instantaneous feedback, because that's what we all want, right? Nobody wants to wait. We want it now. We want to know what's going on. And, and um, we're working to be more responsive all the time. Any other discussion among board members? I mean, RAC members, sorry. <laughs> Don't get that confused. Brock, for ready for it, I'll make the motion to approve as presented. Okay, we have a motion to approve as presented by Ben. A second. <laughs> Is that Mike Christensen? Or Christine. Oh, give it to Chris. Uh, we'll give it to Christine. Excellent. Yep. Okay, okay, I'll call roll. Uh, ben Lauder. Yes. Christine, Christine Schmitz. Schmitz. Yes. Danny Potts. Yep. Um, Eric Reed. Yes. Josh Leonard. Yes, sir. Ken Strong. Yes. Uh, Mike Christensen. Yes. Scott Jensen. Yes. yes. That is passes. Motion passes 8-0 unanimously. Okay, excellent. The next item on the agenda is once in a lifetime permit recommendations for 2021. Turn the time over to Jason to provide a summary of the public comments. All right, thanks, Brock. So the question for this was which best describes your position regarding the once in a lifetime permit recommendations? 
we had 70% that strongly agreed. Um, there were 0% that somewhat agreed. 20% that were neutral, 10% somewhat disagreed, and nobody strongly disagreed. With this um, recommendation, we only had three comments of the 31 that came in. Three were directed towards once in a lifetime. Um, one of the comments, uh, they expressed concern about next year's permit numbers. Uh, future dramatic fluctuations and possible point creep uh, that would come from reductions in the future or fluctuations. Another comment identified concern about dis uh, the disproportionate number of moose taken in Cottonwood Canyon. And then one commented they'd like to have residents be able to apply for once in a lifetime, all once in a lifetime species. Uh, in the same year and non-residents only one species per year and that's what I have Rock. Thank you very much Jason. Um, any questions for Riley from the rack? Yeah Riley I got a question for you. Uh, how many buffalo were killed on the over-the-counter permits? Do you by chance know? Yeah, I, um, Hunter Harvest, we had, I believe, 98 reported. Uh, somebody, I, I think if we're counting wounding loss, uh, the potential to be much higher is certainly there, but we were right at 100 that were taken with the over-the-counter permit. Is that something that's going to continue on? I think for the time being, that is one of the tools that we've uh, established as that's trying to help that area, the private property and and issues that we have there. Uh, so for the time being, I think that's one of the tools that have been established and by all accounts, we have felt it was successful this year. So yeah, a uh, short answer is there aren't any immediate plans to do away with that. So in that vein, so, Riley, have you seen a successful result? Is it moving animals back or is it just killing animals that came across? So that's a, that's a good question. Uh, the answer to that is, is both. I think that it, it helped push some of the, the bison back. When we took our flights this year, we did see uh, a different distribution of bison. It kept animals and gave us a tool to keep animals off of the private property where they were causing some problems. And so... Uh, the combination of both, I think, is what excites me and the biologist the most. So the answer is yes. It, it was a it was a combination, and and we'll continue to evaluate that. You know, these bison are smart. Uh, they they can move and and make decisions quickly. And so, who's to say that it'll continue to work the same in years to come? This was just year one of a new hunt, and. And we'll be proactive if we find that it's not working in a similar way. But as long as it continues to work as such, uh, I don't see the short term changing that. It was it was nice to have a tool to to move some off of that private property or in different areas where we don't want them, and it did redistribute them in a positive manner. Riley, do you have a number as to how many of those permits were sold? Uh, I don't, I could get that for you, Ben. I don't have that off the top of my head. Okay. I'm, I'm just curious about success rate on that. So anyway. Yeah, I, I will, uh, I will try and get that for you. Okay, I, cool. Um, go ahead, Ken. I know that there was a, a lot of people that was excited about it. I've had a lot of people contact me this year that want to try it. I think it'll go be more permits sold this year than there was last year. Yeah, and another follow-up question, actually, Riley. Um, did, did you find, or, or and you may not have this data, were people primarily accessing them through public means or private means? Uh, so I don't know that I have the official data, but from what I understand from talking to some of the private landowners, the majority of the individuals that harvested were uh, 
getting in or accessing that through public access points. Uh, it seemed to be a very small number were going in through the private or at least some of the private. Cool. And and Ben, that's a okay. I don't without a complete survey or knowing, I don't know. That's that's anecdotal, but I'm I'm confident in saying that most of them came in through the public. Yeah, sure. That's fair. All right. Um, sticking on the, the topic of Buffalo, um, I'm going to switch to the Henry Mountain. Um, we're looking at a pretty, pretty big increase in tags on the Henrys, which is great. I love seeing that increased opportunity. Um, but we've only, we're only seeing a, an increase of one permit from three to four on the archery hunt. Um, why are all the other hunts getting such a, you know, a, a two to three type, two to three X permit increase and we're only going one additional permit on that archery hunt? Uh, ben, that's a good question. I mean, this is just kind of personal preference and, and ease. I think that if we, we look at the Henry Mountains as a whole, we were quite aggressive trying to get ahead of uh, what appears to be eminent drought conditions and range conditions. And so the, the uh, permit recommendation is aggressive. It is trying to get ahead of some of that and where those tags fall out. I mean, some of that is just uh, biologist choice or, or preference as to where we can get the highest success out of that. Um, but yeah, there is, there is only one increase and, and really there's probably not a lot of justification given other than in an effort to try and reduce and get ahead of, of some of these conditions that we're certainly going to face and, and mother nature could change, but at the moment it sure looks like we're, we're in for a dry summer and poor range conditions. Then the majority of one of those permits went to higher success uh, hunts. And so I don't know if that's a sufficient reasoning, but that is the reasoning behind it. So yes, yeah, if, if, if this rack had the appetite um, would, would uh, would there be any, any issues with increasing the number of those permits on that hunt to say maybe six or eight, just to give a, be a little more consistent on that increase? So, so, so I, actually, actually Ben, why don't you save, save that, that for our discussion, our discussion part, part and let's, let's make sure we have any questions. questions. I think it's, it's a great, great topic, topic to discuss. discuss. Well, that, that, that was a question to, to Riley to, to Riley, is, yeah. is that feasible? So, so yeah, I mean, yeah, Ben, I certainly anything that the rack has an appetite for, I mean, most things we're able to accommodate and do what we can with that. Where we are being so aggressive right now, if we come in at average harvest success, we're dropping that population below population objective. So we are keeping in mind that this is a pretty, pretty aggressive recommendation the desire to add additional tags to that archery hunt uh, on top of what is already being offered. Maybe not the region nor my uh, biggest desire, but if we wanted to reallocate those in a way that uh, maybe kept our same harvest success and ended in the same location, but just more of them allocated towards archery, I, I'm sure we could we could work something like that if that's what the rack was, was concerned about or, or had an appetite for. Uh, does that answer your question all right, Ben? I mean, that's not one we're going to fall on our sword over. I think that the opportunity and the harvest success is what we are most interested in that area. Yes, yeah, sir. Wiley, what Thank was you. the harvest success on our tree? I'm, I'm sorry, I didn't, I didn't uh, catch that question. What was the harvest success on our tree? Yeah. Yeah. You're muted, Riley. Kobe or Ken, are you still on the line? Could you maybe help me find that number? I, I'll see if I can pull it up on the specific hunt. Yeah, can, uh, Give me a minute. Riley, I'm looking up. Are you Thank looking you, Ken. Um, One at a time. <laughs> so uh, let's go, Scott, right now while Ken's looking it up. Riley, there was some discussion last year about changing the season date on that archery hunt. 
at the board meeting. Uh, it was initially the first hunt that we felt it was pushing the animals off of the on the winter range earlier in the year. As I recall, that hunt date got pushed back, like between rifle hunts now. So is that is that still the case? So by adding it's, it's now adding, the last hunt. It's now the last hunt. So by adding archery hunts late in the year, we're not having the effect of pushing the animals off early. Yeah, it, as Ben mentioned, it's now the last hunt. I mean, it has, it is the last hunt of the year. So I don't, I think that concern of pushing them off early has uh, pretty much gone away with, with the timing of the hunt that was recommended in the fall. And I don't know, I'm not sure if this information is available or not, but are draw odds any different between the any weapon hunt versus the end? That's not me, I'm pretty sure. <laughs> is there, I guess, is there, is there a reason to, to do an archery specific or are the draw odds pretty similar between any weapon and somebody can drive any weapon and hunt archery regardless? Uh, typically, the draw odds are a little bit better. On this specific hunt, I don't have that right in front of me, but, but generally speaking, drawing archery is uh, a little bit easier than the any legal weapon, but you are correct. If they do draw the any legal weapon, they do have the ability to hunt with archery. Lindy, you're, you're on. Can you help me answer jump. that question? Yeah, I jumped on real quick. So on the Henry archery permit, the draw odds are, you got to have around 21 permits to be in the max point category for that archery permit. And then just for the any legal weapon, it's about for the hunter's choice, you're into the 24, 25 points for max round. So they're pretty similar. So people that they want that archery hunt, they're using their points for it. What are the total applicants, Lindy? I mean, the actual draw odds, um, you know, one in yep. what, what for, one in for archery? Two twenty one. So you got, last year. year we had 443 applicants year. for the archery. And for rifle? And for rifle? Hmm. Gotta go back up to it. Sorry, I'm just scrolling. Um, one in nine seventy one. Um, one in nine seventy one. So nine hundred seventy one. So nine hundred seventy one. Because we had so thirty, it's, almost thirty nine hundred applicants. Thirty nine hundred applicants. Yeah. So considerably hard, harder to draw an uh, any weapon permit than than a than an archery permit. I mean, it's oh, for sure. all oh, for sure. hard. But. Lindy, while you're there, can you, can you tell us the, a previous question was how many over the counter bison tags were sold on the book cliffs? It was about 234. Huh. Yeah, 200, around 134 permits were sold for that over the counter bison. Thank you. Yep. And, and also, Ben asked the question what was the archer success rate for the hunts offered there? That was a hundred percent. The book cliffs also has an archery hunt. It was also a hundred percent. So, yeah, that was yeah. yeah. But ben, I'd be on board to support your proposal to switch some of those over to archery. Yeah, I, I've got some additional thoughts on there if we're ready for that conversation. But I don't, I don't know if we're to that point yet. Are there other questions for Riley before we go to that comment discussion? Ben, can I add, add one more thing? Just it, even though that was 100%, I don't know if you should base an early season bison archery hunt hunter success to be the same as a January Henry Mountains bison archery hunt. I just want to make, make sure that we're not doing, we have the data, we choose the data, and that may not be the best comparison. Kobe, yeah, I, was, Kobe, I you. agree with you. That's, that's something I plan to address when we're ready to discuss that. Yep. Any other questions for Riley? Yeah, yeah, Riley, I have a question and I, I kind of put put it to Kobe earlier. And it's hard. I don't I'm sorry, I apologize. I don't have the rack packet in front of me. It's hard to recreate the videos. What's the bison recommendation in book cliffs overall? Um, and uh bison recommendation for Little Creek? Because I, I feel like if nutritional value is a limiting factor, that that's a really significant 
um, number to have. Right, in, in the book list, Little, Little Creek Road List, uh, we have two different hunts there, the hunter's choice and the, the cow only, and both of them increased by five permits. And so it'd be a total of 10 overall permit increase. Uh, if we're talking about, you ask for the Henry Mountains or the book cliffs only, and that yeah, recommendation. Book, no, the book cliffs, the whole unit for the, the hunter's choice. Yeah. Uh, it, you know, if I add those up, it looks it looks to me as though we are increasing overall uh, eight permits with the bulk of those coming in in the Little Creek area. So the majority of our our bison increase this year is is definitely coming off the Henrys. But uh, looking at the book clips, we are certainly getting aggressive on some of those units as well. Well, and Riley, I think I think we need to add to that that we've harvested a lot of bison. Um, on the book list over the last couple of years. We've been very aggressive. And, and the, the, we have some concerns over putting too much pressure in, in the roadless area because it's, it's such a small area. To us, it's giant. You know, to us, it takes days to get across, and to them, it takes minutes. So um, you try to navigate that, offering the harvest, pushing that back. We've already done that on the rest of the book list quite a bit. And so we are willing to give some more opportunity in the road list and we want to still maintain a quality hunt and work through those things. Yeah, thank, thank you for adding that, Kobe. That is accurate. Riley, have the wild horse bench bison stopped behaving the way they had in the past? Uh, you know, that, that's, a, that's a good question. If the region was here, I'd let them answer that and get into the weeds a little bit more. I think the, the answer is that they continue to act in a manner that we would expect. They're, they're still, uh, they have not changed behavior drastically. And, and you know, my, forgive me, this may come to how new I am and, and knowing that area specifically. And Kobe or Ken, if you had an, an opinion, please jump on on this one. But I don't believe so. I think that the wild horse bench is continuing to to participate in the way that it has in the past, and and hence, you know, we continue to offer similar similar tags and and different opportunities and tools to manage that herd the, the way we have in the past. Well, I think the the reason why I asked is um, when it was first introduced, I think there was around fifteen or twenty permits there. Um, and then it went up to like the mid forties, but they also included that little portion of Nine Mile Range Creek. Um, and then now we're down to, to, to three permits. So I just didn't know yeah. if. And, and some of that too just happens to, you know, we, uh, we have poor success last year. The migration does seem to change a little bit on it. So there, it's a longer season uh, in, in hopes to change it. And you did, you know, early on when you talked about we were offering so many more permits, we were in an effort to try and change that quickly. And some of that has changed. But if we're talking recently in, in you know, last year, year before that, it, we're seeing similar trends. Kobe, you hopped on and had a comment, and, and you certainly have more history with that particular area than I do. So, well, Mike, I think, I think what I would say is anytime you're hunting a migration hunt, it's a risk, right? Uh, you know, I was, I was, talking to a, a good friend who um, went on a caribou hunt in Alaska. The caribou had migrated the same way for like 79 years. And the year he decided to go, they didn't come. You know, he he has had poor enough luck that in a, year, a migration that was over 80 years, they went a different route once every 80 years. And we've seen a similar thing on on this hunt. It's been a great hunt and a great experience for several hunters. And we are pretty detailed on the hunt planner when we say, this is a migration hunt. Um, you know, at, overall, they've come. Folks have had great success. And we've had a couple of years where it's been a really difficult hunt. And there have been not the number of bison on the unit that there, there would be for um, to have a great hunt. So... It's a risky. We've pulled way back on permit numbers. We've had some great success there, and we'll continue to evaluate that to see if it makes a good bison unit. Thanks.
other questions for Riley? Hearing none, I'll open it up to for discussion among the RAC members. Ben, I know you have something, so why don't you start? All right, sure. Yeah, I'll lead out. Um, okay, yeah, so my thoughts on, on the, the Henry's um, bison, as I stated, looking through these hunts, all the hunts are increasing by two to three X, except for that archery hunt is increasing by one permit, which is 25%. Um, and and we've, we've discussed briefly um, success rates and, and for historical context, those success rates are from when that hunt was in uh, September and October. Um, the hunt is now mid to end of January. I think it ends on January 31st. I don't remember the start date. It's around the 17th-ish, I think. Um, so it's going to be a much more difficult hunt. And I anticipate, and I would imagine the DWR would anticipate as well, we're probably not going to see that high of success rate that we've seen uh, in that December. I mean, it's a, it's a January hunt with a bow. I expect success rates to be down. And so given that and the total increase, wh what I would look for here is, you know, I'll, I'll just start by throwing out a number. There was, it was three. The recommendation is four. I'm not so sure we couldn't give eight and assume a 50 to 70% success rate and still be safe with our harvest. Um, that's, that's, that's where I'll start. And I'd like to hear, hear feedback from the RAC members and, and get your thoughts. Thoughts on, on Ben's idea here. So you guys have probably heard me talk about this before and I'm, I'm all for more opportunity but I, I don't like giving opportunity to one smaller group of hunters because I feel it's divisive. When we look, the, the Henry Mountains, uh, the, one, the one Henry Mountains hunt had uh, 3,886 applicants for, for the hunter's choice. Let me just scroll up here. Um, the other hunt had, um, and this is just for hunter's choice, 1626 um applicants you know so you got well over 5000 applicants for the any weapon hunt you had 443 applicants for the archery hunt and so i look at it like this is the opportunity to go hunting it's not about about the necessarily always about the success and the kill rate um so I, I would be okay with another permit or two, but I I wouldn't be in favor of doubling that opportunity just based on the sheer number of applicants that want to do that hunt. You know, if we, every, you know, it, it just, I mean, and we don't know what the success rate will be. It could be 100%, it could be 0%, but we have no data to go on. So I'd probably be against a, a high increase, I could go for a permit or two, but not to, not a doubling of it. Other comments or discussion? So based on that ratio, that's basically 12 times the number of applicants for, for the any weapon versus archery, if we have the data correct. What's the so what permit number? I'd like to address that real quick. Um, so realize, and anybody that's applying for this hunt is an applicant that's been taken out of that rifle hunt. And the tags that we've added for these archery hunts from the beginning have all been additive. None of them have ever taken away from existing tags. And the idea there is with a lower success rate hunt is what we're shooting for. And granted, that hasn't happened with the September and October season. I do believe that will happen with the January season. And also, these permits aren't given to a small um, segment of people. They're available to everybody. Anybody can apply for them. It's a matter of, of, of personal preference what you choose to apply for. 
I mean, the, the statistics are out there. You, if, if you decide to apply, you know you're applying for a tougher hunt. You know you might have better draws. Um, but there's no rules out there saying that a rifle hunter can't pick up and learn how to shoot a bow and go go apply for a bow hunt. These tags are available to everybody, just like the any weapon tags are. And I, I, I just, I mean, I, I think that that's true, Ben, that, that they are available to, to any hunter. I think it's kind of disingenuous to, not you're disingenuous, but it is a little bit to, to, to say that, uh, um, you know, anybody can go do it because anybody can't go do it. Um, and it has been a hundred percent success rates have been completely additive to the, to the, the harvest. I mean, it's had 100% success rates. We don't know what the success rate will be with this. Um, and and on the same token, it's an any weapon tag. So an, what stops an archer from picking up an any weapon tag and uh, and shooting his butt bison with a bow? I mean, that that's what happened for years and years. Um, so I'm not I'm not against archery tags. I'm just against giving out so much of the opportunity to to less than 10% of the, of the applicants. So that's just where I stand. So I, I I'll just leave it at that. Uh, I'll, I'll weigh in real quick. And, and I have a second follow-up question. That's a different um, subject. So I'll leave that for, for now. Um, but I, I tend to, I tend to like Ben's position because I, I think his position is one that um, it, it's favoring a segment of the population that's willing to harvest and, and as Riley and Kobe have stated, a migra migration hunt that has limited odds. And if we can give out a few more tags, we're already at hundred percent success rate. Let's give out a few more tags. And if 75 or 80% fill it, that gets us where we need to go. So I, I, I would, I would tend to uh, support uh, Ben's idea. Um, and I'll leave that until my follow-up question when we get onto it. What proportion of the tags are going to archery under the proposal? I'm trying to look it up in the packet. Yeah, so it, it looks like the uh, we have the book class, Archery Hunter's Choice. Uh, we're recommending five. Uh, and then on the Henry Mountains Archery Hunter's Choice, uh, there's four. It would be an increase of a, an overall increase of one permit from last year over the two hunts. And so out of, I mean, a very small number, if, if we're looking at five and four, nine out of the 147. Well, so doesn't, doesn't, the, doesn't seem like a real hunt if it's a hundred percent success rate. Just, just saying. <laughs> so Brock, well, I don't think you the, can look uh, at the overall. I don't think you can look at the overall numbers. Like in the book cliffs, archers are getting what about twenty nine percent of the of the hunter's choice permits for the for the book cliffs. They're so they're getting almost thirty percent at a hundred percent success rate. So so you can't tell me that's not additive and 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 increasing the draw weight for the any weapon hunter. And then on the on the there's four for the Henry Mountains right now. There's there's recommended four um, archery permits, and it looks like there are about almost 50 tags. So that's about eight or nine percent. So that that course that cor that act, that number actually correlates with about how many um, the the ratio of applicants. So there's seven there's 78. So there's there's. There's 79 permits recommended on the Henrys, right. and the four archery would 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 compute to five percent. Yeah, but but you five percent of them are going to archery. But we're just looking at hunter's choice. Like if you look at the hunter's choice, that's well, you, that's what you, you should be look at. How, be looking I, at I in I'm my look opinion, you don't look at the cow hunt. I mean, I go, I would throw in, I go along with if you wanted to a couple cow archery tags, but. Obviously, that ship sailed, but I don't know. I, yeah, I there just, used to be a I mean, cow archer hunt, but it, it got eliminated. 
Yeah. What What is our allocation for deer permits? How do we break those up by species? Uh, pardon me, how do we break those up by weapon types? Archery, muzzle load, and rifle. Isn't it 25%, 25%, 50%? Kobe? I, I believe it's 60, 20, 20. 60, 20, 20. Yeah, yeah right. It is. The vast deer. majority are, but there, there are some that deviate from that, but the vast majority are 60, 20, 20. So yeah. I, I'd be inclined to recommend combining muzzle loader and archery and go 40% archery and 60% rifle. I, I mean, think, so, I think the so you're going to give different. Go ahead, Toby. I, I was going to say, this sounds like a great struggle for the rack. This is fun. And I think <laughs> the difference here is, is just that the permits are so limited that you're not arguing between a weapon type split like archery, muzzle, or rifle. You argue between any weapon, which you may have a few other hunters on the mountain, but any weapon on this, you truly could hunt with any weapon you wanted to, or going to archery only. And 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 Ben's right. The intent when we did this was to provide a, a tougher hunt that was lower success that would increase opportunity. Because what we're hearing is point creep. And so we're trying to address that any way we can. If you know going in, you're only gonna have a 50% chance. If you pick one limited to that, awesome. If it's a hundred percent success, then it probably didn't do what we uh, intended it to do initially. And and there's a couple different ways that this came about, but one of the ways was to provide more opportunity to reduce, reduce success on once in a lifetime species. Um, and that's definitely the intent now as we move forward. And in January, it just might do that. So, so Mike, if we want to talk just hunter's choice numbers, um, that comes up seven and a half percent of the current recommendations. So, um, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll do this. I, it, Brock, if we're ready, I'll I'll make a motion. I'll I'll back my number off. The current recommendation is four. I was suggesting eight. I'd meet in the middle at six. I'll make the motion that we adjust the permit numbers on the Henry Mountains Archery Hunters Choice from from the division's recommendation of four to um, six. That would that would be a two x increase from last year, which puts it more in line. Still not. It more in line with the with the rest of the recommendations. Still probably low from the other permit increases, but okay. So Ben's made to increase the number of archery tags on the book cliffs to six. Do we have a second? I'll second it. Ben strong seconds. Wait, that isn't that weren't we talking about the Henry Mountains, not the book cliffs? That's what I meant, the Henry Mountains. Okay, just want to make sure. Six bison archery tags on the Henry Mountains. Good correction, Mike. Thank so does you, Mike. this although does I'll this, click on the books too. Does this re include a reduction in rifle tags so we're not uh, increasing total tag total tag numbers? Is it just an increase in our just in I my motion is for just an increase. I'm not asking to decrease anything, and I'm justifying that by the January season. I expect a lower success rate. Any discussion on the motion? I'll call for a vote. Ben Louder. Yes. Christine Schmitz. Yes. Danny Potts. Yeah, I'll go with it. Eric Reed. No. Uh, Josh Leonard. Is there Ken Strong? Yes. Uh, Mike Christensen. Yes, but I also want to explain my vote. I did say I would vote for a permit or two increase. I do it with hesitation, and I'm also going to hold Ben to it. If it comes back at 100% next year, I'm asking for a decrease again. Okay, Scott Jensen. Well, I'm going to say yes, but I think we ought to be higher than that. I think we ought to distribute permit numbers based on weapon types and be a little more equitable. 
So the motion passes yeah. seven to one. If you'd like to make a different motion, Scott, <laughs> you're welcome to make it. But but uh, I think there's broad support for what we've got. Let's stay there. But going okay. forward, I, I generally agree with that as well. But I don't vote. Yeah, and I mean. Archers only make up about 9% of the applicants and they're getting 20% of the permits. So I think it's already pretty uh, equitable for an archer. So. And I do like to archer that, on, well, for the record exactly, on public state. That's exactly the data I was trying to dig out and I that didn't seem to be the case. So, but as we move forward, I'd really like to have that information. Yeah, I don't think it's quite that many either. Okay. Uh, other, any other motions to be made or discussions on, we'll have at least one more motion, but any other discussions on uh, once in a lifetime? Hey, hey, before you make a motion, um, Ken Strong asked Riley a question very, to start the Buffalo discussion. I'm really curious to know from Ken, um, what, what's your interest in the Range Creek hunt? Why did you... Like what preface that question? What do you what, what's your interest in that that hunt? I guess, Ken. I I've been having people ask me about it, talking about it. I know a crew right now that have bought rafts to go down the river and so forth to go in on this, and and they're pretty excited about it, and they've been hounding me about it uh, to to push it, and I of course I couldn't go, but uh, that was my reason for asking it is is because I know that there's a lot of people that are interested in it. I think that's true, Ken. I've had a lot of people comment and I know two people that went in this year and they were successful and both are planning to go again next year. <laughs> Sounds like we better put a cap on that one pretty quick. Well, I, I, I asked the yeah I think it's the most exciting hunt in the state right now. So that's the only question I asked. <laughs> Anybody want to go tomorrow? <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's talk. <laughs> okay. Other discussion. Hearing none, I'd entertain a motion on the remaining recommendations. So moved. <laughs> I move that we have presented. Okay, we have a motion to accept. I'm writing down the remainder of the once in a lifetime permit recommendations. Motion by Mike, second by Ben. Uh, Call for a vote. Ben Louder. Yes. Christine Schmitz. Yes. Danny Potts. Yes. Eric Reed. Yes. Josh Leonard. Yes. Ken Strong. Yes. Mike Christensen. Yes. Scott Jensen. Yes. Motion passes unanimously. Eight zero. The next item on the agenda is the antlerless permit recommendations. I'll turn the time over to Jason to summarize the public comments. All right, thanks, Brock. So the question on this is which best describes your position regarding the antlerless permit recommendations? We had 50% strongly agree, 12.5% uh, somewhat agree, 25% neutral, 12.5% somewhat disagree and nobody strongly disagreed. For this recommendation, we had three written comments that were provided. Uh, one was to even further reduce or cut antlerless permits. One comment was they didn't want uh, antlerless tags outside of depredation situations. And then there was one uh, comment to support cow elk permits on the book cliffs. And that's all I have, Brock. Thank you very much, Jason. Uh, questions for Kobe from the from the rack.
Hearing no questions from the RAC, discussion about the recommendations among the RAC members. Hearing none, I would entertain a motion. I'll move that we accept the antlerless permit recommendations as presented. We have a motion, from, a motion from, from Scott to accept recommendations as presented. And I'll second it. And a second from Ken Strong. I think we let Kobe off too easy. Any discussion on the motion? Later, Rack. <laughs> <laughs> Any discussion on the motion? I'll just say that I'm disappointed to see the uh, the 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 animal smooth on that disappeared. The one on the on the unit. Disappointed to see that go away, but I understand. <laughs> Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll add one discussion point that, that probably doesn't need a QA. and a um, There was a fairly large increase on Fish Lake Thousand Lakes for antlerous elk harvest. Um, this recommendation was almost in par with the last four to four year uh, in, uh, total take. And, and, and I guess my comment would be, I, I like a robust antlerless elk harvest. I think it's important for people to be able to kill elk and it's hard to kill a bull. But but I like to see like a regulated sort of um, harvest permit status. So instead of 76, which is the case in 2019, to 400, which is gonna be as is in, in 2021, like can we set a, 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 a regulatory line if possible and have that stabilize a bit and that's a, that's more of a comment than than a than a criticism i just i wanted to add that to the to the record is what is what you're saying maybe a more tempered approach to to increases when when we can yeah. I, I, if we can offer more elk on the landscape and killing more elk 100 percent yes Okay, thanks, Josh. Any other discussion? We have a motion on the table. I'll call a vote. Ben Lauder. Yes. Christine Schmitz. Yes. Annie Potts. Yep. Yeah. Eric Reed. Yes. Josh Leonard. Yes. Ken Strong. Yes. Mike Christensen. Yes. Scott Jensen. Yes. Passes unanimously, 8-0. Next item on the agenda, item number nine, 2021 CWMU antlerless permit recommendations. Uh, I'll turn the time over to Jason for uh, a summary of the public comments. All right, so the question, which best describes your position regarding the CWMU antlerless permit recommendations? We had 83% that were neutral, and we had 17% that somewhat disagreed. All other categories uh, were 0%. And on this recommendation, we had no written comments from the public. Thank you, Jason. Questions for Chad? Hey, is there a, a summary of, oh, go ahead. Let's go Scott oh. first and then Mike. Yep. I was just gonna ask, do you have a, do we have a number of people that responded to that? Uh, the 83%, is that overall the 20 or 30 some people? Is that? Jason. Just a sec, Scott, and I'll look that up real quick. Okay, while well, he's asking, looking that up, Mike. Yeah, my comments along the same lines. I serve on the CWMU advisory committee, and and it's really disappointing to me that that there was not one person that showed a favorable um, input towards that CWMU recommendation. 
and we see that every year. And so um, I know Chad is going to work hard to, as we go forward, putting out good information on CWMUs and trying to change that to, to help the, the public's uh, opinion of that. So. Hey, Scott, it looks yeah. like four people uh, answered the question. Four people had input on okay. agreement, neutral, or disagree. Of the okay. 31, yeah, the 31 that first. responded. Hard to get much out of those numbers, but I think the point is simply that I don't think we know much about this program. I don't think the public knows much about the program. It's something that could use some more education, uh, just so people are more aware of it, its virtues, vices, et cetera, so we get some more feedback, maybe. I agree with that, Scott. And I also think that it would be nice if we put real pressure on cows on all these units. I mean, one of the one of the ways they allocate permits is by how many animals are living on the private land. And the less we put pressure on them, the more that are on there. And, and so they get more bull tags if they harvest less cows too, because they have more elk on their land. Yeah, that, that's, that's kind of the question I had. Um, just go, tagging on to Josh's uh, question, uh, question for Chad. Um, on the Fish Lake where we've increased uh, antlerless permits so drastically over the last couple of years. Um, whoops. Is there, a, are the CWMUs in that herd unit also increasing their harvest? It's a great question. That is a good question. Um, we can pull up my, I'm not being real familiar with which CWMUs are exactly in which unit um it, i wish the region was on here to to be able to ask that but um i know that there was at least one cwmu i talked to vance and they actually requested to increase their their cow tag so I, so i know that there was some increase but i don't know if it's proportional to what what um the unit has done um and a lot of those decisions are, are left up to the the regional biologist um it, it, one of the tenets of the CWMU program is that the, that they do have to help with management objectives. So, with that being said, it is it is asked of them um, to to help out with the cow harvest. Yeah. But looking looking at the southern region, I just pulled up my PowerPoint. Looking at it, it, it looks like uh, Bar J Ranch went up ten. I think that one's on the Fish Lake. I'm not. I'm not a hundred percent sure, but but my guess would be that we increased ten tags. Okay. Well, like, what about uh, Booby Hole? Yeah, they were the um, the only one that increased for elk was Bar J. Uh, okay. The other ones were pronghorn increases. So that just kind of goes along with that, that they're not increasing their take, which as these elk get pressured from all these additional antlerless tags on the public, they're gonna be moved onto private and in many cases, those large CWMUs that don't, that aren't taking their, their share. So this is my concern too, Mike. It, it it decreases the overall opportunity for the average public hunter because there's fewer elk available on public land. Exactly. That's why the private land tags have been so successful to displace those elk off of private onto public. And we can't, we can't do that with CWMUs if, if we're not probably holding their feet to the fire a little bit more. I, I think Chad, going going forward, what I'd like to see personally on these CWMU recommendations would be a um, uh, looking at the the past permits that the CWMU has had, and then the recommended permits for the current year, because like that's what we do with all of our other permits. We you know we we can look and see how many permits the Fish Lake offered you know three years ago. And then we can kind of compare it to what they're offering now and we get an idea. But with the CWMU, like I couldn't tell you if, if Booby Hole 
should have 10 or, you know, I mean, if, have they had 10 for 20 years and they've never changed? So that's not adaptive man management, just in my opinion. Just to clarify on that, Mike, um, are you saying, are you wanting to see them per hunt unit? Or are you just saying, because because on that PowerPoint, it does say what they had last year and what the, the change was. Um, so, okay. so so we did, but that is just over one year. But I wonder if it would be helpful too to, to break it down into units like the fish lake and say overall in this unit, we had X amount of increase. That, that, that probably would be a, a helpful practice. Yeah, yeah, that's what I'm referring to. And I'm I'm just looking at the divisions, um, the PDF packet that, that we received. Me too. Um, and I, I, I liked your presentation. I thought it was really good on the um the online presentation. Yeah, I'm I'm looking at the packet as well, and I don't I that? don't see where it says how many permits were offered last year. I just see the current recommendation. Maybe I'm looking in the wrong place. It was only in the presentation. It's not in the packet. Uh, so, so that's uh, the other correction I can make is I can, I can. And it was only in that packet, the change to. I, I agree with what Mike's saying. I, I, a lot of people, I don't understand the CWM unit or CWMU program as, as well as I should. And I know I get a lot of questions about it and a lot of people that are unhappy, but I think that it's, that's something that, that needs to be done. I agree with Mike. Yeah, Mike, you make a lot of good, really good points. And I, I really like the idea of um, going forward, yeah, tying the CWMU analyst recommendations to the um, rec analyst recommendations of the unit that they reside within, and also, um, you know, putting that information in the packet so we can so we can see that. Because I, I, you, you made some really good points that I haven't really considered about becoming a, you know, a, um, a uh, you know, safe place for animals to run to if we're not putting the right pressure on them. Just a question of clarification, uh, Chad. If, a, if an operator is allocated, say, eight antlerless uh, permits, um, are, do you collect the data on harvest success rates on those eight permits? Like, I mean, just because they have eight permits doesn't necessarily require them to fill them. I mean, are they filling them generally? Or uh, just help me understand that a little bit, if you, if you could, please. Yeah, they, they get surveyed. We get the results from that. Um, and that's an, another area where we're trying to hold the line a little bit better. Um, we have some, uh, an example is like Deseret, they get, what was I think 260, 280 cow tags and they their success rate was like 90%. But but honestly, we have other CWMUs that might get 15 and they kill three. So so we're kind of all over the board. Uh, you know, not all CWMUs are, are created equally, but, but honestly, we have some that struggle. Um, getting our cow harvest, and we have others that do really well. Um, there's some that are 100% every year. Um, and that that is something where I plan on working with the CWMU advisory on that. Uh, on We did, Mike Wardle, when he was in this position a couple years back, brought in a bunch of people that, a bunch of CWMUs that were underperform, I, shouldn't, I don't know if I should say underperforming, but, but what we felt weren't hitting the bar uh, for antlerless harvest, um, and it, it started to open the eyes. But with with this position and and I guess the amount of different people that have had it, it's been hard to keep that momentum going. Um, I'm looking at that right now, and potentially this might be news for Mike since he's on that committee. But potentially doing another committee meeting uh, later this spring or or early in the summer to address that specifically. I hope that answered that. Did I answer that? I mean, yes, in part, but I guess I'm still not clear if if the struggle is to recruit hunters to fill the tag or whether it's it's a struggle to to fill the tag once there's a hunter there because it's like, you know, the elk have wandered onto some other range or off the property or I, I guess that would be the 
you answered the question, but I, I guess the it begs another question. Yeah. So, so some of the struggle is, is a lot of times if if the CWMU is choosing a ninety ten split, then a hundred percent of the tags are going to the the public. So these are public hunters. Um, generally speaking, I mean, when you look at those total recommendations, there's, I mean, a vast majority of those tags are for the public. So, so generally, no, 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 no. no. The the question is, if they have five antlerless permits and they're only filling one of it, is because they're they haven't sold the tag or recruited the tag or or no that that's what i'm saying is is that generally that's a public hunter it's the tag is there it's, that tag goes out of somebody's the hand yeah it's it's a draw tag so it's it's there somebody's got that um part of what we run into is when they're hunting bulls they don't like to hunt cows um so so we do see that where you know they've got that two month prime time where they're they're mostly just hunting bulls and and a lot of them will wait until the end of the year to start hunting cows and then sometimes they're not always there and it's a more difficult hunt. Um, I think sometimes you also have people that are public hunters that see CWMU and expect to just drive down the road and be able to shoot one and load it in. And so sometimes sometimes I think you're getting public hunters that are that in their mind are just saying hey, this is an easy hunt. I don't have to work. I don't have to do anything, and and with those those factors together, I think sometimes it causes some some hard hardships on on the CWMUs to get those uh, to get the harvest that they need. Yeah, that's helpful. Thank you. Sounds like there's a lot of work that could be done there. My feeling is there ought to be a disproportionate number of cow elk permits on CWMUs. To put enough pressure on those animals to push them back onto the public. Not if if this is a formula based thing like the way that uh, buck and bull permits are allocated based on acreage, I think we ought to be doing like a two or three or five or ten fold number on cows to push those animals back off, and that season date ought to correspond to when there are public cow hunts on that same unit, so we can push pressure on those private lands to push the animals back onto the public. Land. Yeah, and those there, are ought to be an, there ought to be an incentive that goes along with that to retain your bull permits. You've got to achieve some sort of objective on the cow permits. Yeah, and, and those are some good points, Scott. And we do, I know that in certain areas, at least, that we have talked to CWMUs, and, and I guess I, I, it's hard for us to mandate that, but we've encouraged them that the timing of their cow harvest is also helpful. Uh, some of the some of the other issues, though, as far as like um, some of the mandates, sometimes we want those elk on the CWMU. They're, the CWMU sometimes are are making it so that the the depredation is is kind of gone away. So rather than pushing them off the CWMU late in winter, it's a place for them to to stay where they're being tolerated rather than being in somebody's a uh, haystack or, or so so it's it's complicated and it, it varies from region to region and, and cwmu to cwmu so that's that's where we run into a lot of the, the issues with with this program is to have the flexibility but yet have have the ability to to hold hold them to align while maintaining flexibility for them to be able to operate it as as it needs to be yeah understood Understood, except elk are so different than deer. I mean, elk respond to pressure. And so if you're not putting pressure on them, it just reduces opportunity for the public. Whereas deer, they stay in the same place, really regardless of pressure. When they get pressure, they hunker down a little bit. And when they're released from pressure, they become more active, but they don't move like elk do. Hey, Chad, this is Eric Reed. Can I ask you a question as to the appetite of the... Uh... CWMU guys, when it comes to antlerless hunting, you know, more people on their land, how do they respond to that? I know there's, you know, some of the discussions we've had in the past is that it seems like, uh, and maybe just the responses from some of those that have hunted on CWMUs don't seem to get when it's a private, the difference between a private and a public tag or a tag that is sold to a client versus a public one and that kind of access or or availability to the to the different parts. I don't know if that plays a part to, of it 
And how would they respond to saying, hey, you've got to harvest more, allow more public people on your ground? Yeah, on a, to be honest, that's sometimes the battle with this is, uh, and this this is going back to the days when I was a biologist, is sometimes you battled with the CW Muse of, of finding that, that happy medium of getting the harvest that you needed from them. Um, and and having them them take it and part part of the probably part of the issue is is when they get the they do a ninety ten split then a hundred percent of those that are going to the the public is that's they don't make any money off of that so so the more that they take I, I guess there's less incentive monetarily for them to take more hunters and then as as what's been brought up here too is that. They, they get they sometimes are wanting to grow the population on there more because then it potentially gives them more bull tags or at least better bulls to harvest with that being said to be fair to the CW muse uh, especially in the northern region where where I was at uh, Morgan South Rich East Canyon those units we couldn't have probably even half the elk that we have without CW muse because they would just be they'd just be every, uh, they were a problem. They were just considered a problem by everybody. So it, they really built tolerance and actually have built the herds as well. Did, did that answer your question? Yeah, it did. It just makes me wonder if uh, you're trying to go on a management action to control a population through the antlerless side and you're pushing the CWMUs to take more animals and, and allow more uh, public to go on there that you might get a little pushback, like you're saying, where they're not benefiting from it and it could impact their, their uh, pocket in a sense down the road, you know, if they're trying to build herds to allow themselves. So how would you use that as a management tool on CWMUs to a, a, an objective? Yeah, and, and frankly, it's just right there in the rule. It's, it states in the rule that they they need to help with our management objectives. And what you might see in the future too um, is you might see us, as our biologists recommend a number and if they don't agree with it, they may come and disagree with that number and, and you might see split recommendations. Um, if we feel really strongly that CWMUs need to, to, to harvest more animals. I would love to see that, Chad. I personally would too. I mean, I, I think the CWMU program is, is fantastic. But when it started, it started as a way to compensate landowners for their loss, to make the, give them an incentive to have this public resource on their land. And at that time, maybe an elk tag was going for $1,500 to these operators. Now that elk tag is going for 15,000. This is half or in some cases more than their half of their annual income, whereas before it was paying for their losses. And so it's a hard, it's a hard battle. Yeah, the economics have changed dramatically, and I think there's a lot more room for public harvest to account for that. And there has been some really good education done within the, the CWMU organizations. I, I personally have, was on the CWMU advisory committee in the mid-2000s, and, and then I've been back on it now for, what, three years, I think. Um, and so in that 10-year span, there's been a lot of changes that are positive, but they don't reflect in the public sentiment because there's not the the ed educational background. And you know, I mean, I, I don't think that we, I mean, I don't think that that I have the ability to go through the, you know, the the recommendations. Um, so, I, in my in my opinion, it's we we probably just pass what what's presented to us, but encourage the division to. Uh, you know, to to look at being more active in the management or using CWM using the management of these herds. So any other discussion? I'd entertain a motion. Move that we accept as presented. Okay. Second. Mike. Mike has moved that we accept. 
the CWMU antlerless permit rec uh, recommendations as presented, and that was seconded by Eric. Any other discussion on the motion before I call a vote? Ben Louder. Yes. Christine Schmitz. Yes. Danny Potts. Yep. Eric Reed. Yes. Josh Leonard. Yes. Ken Strong. Yes. Mike Christensen. Yes. Scott Benson. You know, I'm going to say no. Uh, I, I'm inclined to agree, but I, I want a record of our discussion to be moved forward to the board that we think those numbers should be adjusted upwards considerably. So I'm going to disagree just for the point of that information being passed on to the board. I'm, I'm writing down your, your objection, so just give me a second. And I tend to agree with Scott um, I, with what he just said. I think it makes sense to, to look, look into that. So. I guess rather than changing it here, I, I'd like to see that proposal come from the division rather than us rogue folks out here just saying we want a 3x increase. So, <laughs> Excellent. Thank you very much. Uh, our last agenda item is number 10 conservation rule, uh, permit rule amendments. And I'll turn the time over to Jason to uh, summarize the public comments. All right, thanks again, Brock. Uh, which best describes your position regarding the proposed conservation permit rule revisions? Uh, we had 50% that were neutral, neither agreed nor disagreed, um, zero, somewhat agreed, 25% strongly agreed. Um, then we had 25% somewhat disagree. Sorry, let me say that again. 25% strongly disagree and nobody somewhat disagreed. And then um, from the comments, there were, let's see, two comments. And they were both revolved around, uh, they would prefer DWR to retain the permits and not have conservation groups uh, sell them off and have DWR provide them to the public through a different, through a draw system. Thank you, Jason. Uh, questions here for Justin Shannon. I have a question. Um, if we make them all three year permits, are they under contract for three years and we cannot change that? I mean, how does that work? That three years seems like a eternity in wildlife management in Utah. Yeah, Mike. So right now we currently have a three year program and a one year program. And so what what we're proposing is to merge the one year and the three year programs together. And, um, and so this is, this is how the permits have been done for as long as um, certainly I've been in the division 13, 14 years. And, uh, and so it's, um, it, it, it can be, it can be quite some time, but there's also advantages. I think if a conservation organization has, knows what permits they have over a three year period, then they can market them better and, uh, and and some of that so um yeah it, it it's a long time but i think that stability is a good thing for this program hey brock can i speak to that real quick as well you bet go ahead ben yeah so as, as somebody who's administered um this program for an organization um Justin makes a good point with the the marketing. Uh, I, I've had people call me year after year, um, knowing that we had a cer certain permit, and and you know when when's your banquet? When's it going to be? Um, I'm interested in that permit again. 
Uh, so the consistency is actually really helpful uh, for selling those permits and for advertising them as well. And then as uh, to, to speak to the, you know, the, removing the, the one-year program, the organization that I'm involved with has been, has participated in both the one-year and the three-year. And I, I like this um, recommendation to get rid of the one-year because there's been several years where there were, I don't know, 20 permits or more allocated to the one-year program and nobody participating in it, which meant they just went unused. So um, compliments to the DWR on this recommendation. Thank you, Ben. Other questions for Justin? How does the division, um, it says that every three years, two groups can apply to become a part of it on a probationary basis. How do they decide which two groups if there's, say there's three groups that apply? How does yeah. that work? So um, over the past eight years or so, we haven't had a new group apply. So having two is, is um we thought would provide room for those that did want to join. But if say we had three or four groups apply in a one year period, uh, the language in the rule talks about, we would look at um, their, their historical contributions to wildlife in Utah, and we'd rank them based off of that. And so if you have a brand new startup group that is just right out, you know, ha hasn't um, contributed much or doesn't have much of a track record, we would take conservation organizations that have benefited um, a conservation species and, and rank them that way. Thanks, Justin. Other questions? Yeah, Justin, this is Ken Strong. Uh, I've had a lot of people, uh, quite a few people, who actually have contacted me and said, it's not right that an organization gets all the money that they sell at tag for. And I know that's not correct, but will you break down the way the money's spent? Because there's a lot of people that think if they sell a tag for $80,000, that organization gets $80,000. Yeah, um, thanks, Ken. I, that, that's, a, that's, a good, that's a good point. So say a conservation organization sells a permit for $100,000. Um, the way that it's broken up is 30% of that, or 30 grand, would go directly to the Division of Wildlife. 60% of it would go to the conservation organization, and that money has to be spent on projects that are approved by the Division of Wildlife, and that includes habitat restoration projects, transplants, um, you know, those, those types of things. And then there's a 10% uh, administrative cost that goes to the conservation organizations and they can spend that money however they would like. Um, and so that, that's the breakdown. It's a, it's a 30, 60, 10 split on where that goes. So really 90% is coming back to wildlife and 10% staying with the organization. Correct. That's very generous. That's, that's awesome. D does that breakdown hold true for the expo as well? Um, no, the expo is different. The expo um, is regulated through a, a contract, and um, there's um, let me see. I, I don't have the expo rule in front of me, but I, I, if if uh, if they sell a five dollar application, then a dollar fifty of that has to go back to to projects and then the $3.50 can go towards um, whatever the conservation groups that, that run the expo want. But I will say, based on my experience in working with MDF and SFW, they do spend a lot of their $3.50 on conservation projects. They don't have to, they're not mandated to, but it's um, there's a lot that goes there, so. And, and does that 350 dollars putting on the expo itself? Yeah, there's there's a lot of upfront costs associated with it. I, I don't know all the details. Um, certainly, MDF and SFW could could speak to that better than I can. But I know um, there's a lot of commitments and and a lot of money that needs to be paid up front for expo and booths and and um, 
costs and everything associated with it. So. And Josh, one point of clarification I would add to that. You asked about Expo, the, the permits of the Expo. Do realize that um, what Justin just addressed is the, what's known as the Expo permits, right? The ones you go apply for. But they also sell per, sell conservation permits at their banquets in the Expo. And so uh, that that 90-10 split does apply to those those conservation permits that are sold in the auctions at the Expo. Yeah, sorry guys, I'm I'm getting uh I'm getting some correction here. I, I may have misspoke. So of of the application fees, a hundred percent of it goes to um up goes to projects. It's just the the dollar fifty one. Those are DWR approved projects. The other three dollars and fifty cents still goes to projects, but DWR doesn't have to approve them. So apologize for the misinformation. Thank you, Justin. Other questions for I, Justin? I have one last question. I want to keep them here all night. So, uh, public draw permits that were addressed as those, do th does that include landowner association where it says, well, it says public permits? La does that include landowner association permits or or? You're cutting out, Mike. We're not getting you very well. I, I think I understand the question. Oh, I think I understand the question, Mike. Let me take a stab at it, and if I'm off, um, you can correct me. So that, that's one of the reasons that we wanted to clarify this, um, because we have all sorts of permits. We have previous year's conservation permits. We have expo permits. We have landowner association permits, um, certainly the public draw permits, all those types of things. And um, what, what we wanted to do is say, whatever we take through the public process as a public draw permit, um, that is what conservation permits would be predicated on. And when you do that, um, when we take public draw permits through the public process, um, expo permits are reduced from that. There's a lot of them. And so we just wanted it to be clean and say, whatever public draw permit number we take through the public process, that's what conservation permits would be based on just to keep it really simple and clean. And so that was one of the areas that we felt we could clarify a portion of the rule. I, I like that, that it's only off the drop. Other questions for Justin? Discussion among the members of the RAC. I, I just want to say that I, I've looked at this a little bit and I thought it was kind of interesting that, that when this conservation tags first started, I think we had 11 bighorn sheep permits total in the state. And now look at what we have today because of the conservation and that's paid for transplants and so forth. I think it's a great program. <clears throat> I, I, I have I have just one I guess question I, I got a comment that said um, and, and Justin maybe you can speak to it if you're awarded for example one of these conservation or expo permits you're not required to um, the the wait period for that species and and it's contributing to point creep can you speak to that a, a bit before we go any further um, sure. So the goal of the conservation permit is to generate as much money as we can for, for conservation. And so as, as these rules were put forward, um, the, the, there, there wasn't waiting periods associated with it. I think, I think my, as long as I've been involved in the, the program, there hasn't been a wait period associated with purchasing a conservation permit. Um, and, and so that, that's not part of the rule change or anything. That's just been our, our practice with it. But, but does it, I mean, ultimately it does um, contribute to point creep if you buy an expo tag or you're awarded an expo tag for a, a moose or an elk, and then you can still keep putting in and not lose your bonus points, right? Sure. Yeah, I, I think it, yeah, I think at a small scale, that would, that would be one of the trade-offs of not having 
um, having a waiting period for people that obtain those permits. I mean, I guess just to, to put it out there, it, it seems like <clears throat> for all of us that have multiple bonus points in multiple species in multiple states, if you're awarded, you know, a fish like bull via uh, an expo tag, seems like maybe you should re-enter the wait period is, is just, th that's some feedback I got that I wanted to, to forward on to the group. Any discussion? I, I, I understand what Josh is saying. Then on the other hand, some of these guys that donate millions every year on these conservation tags, if we take them out for a waiting period, that could be thousands or hundreds of thousands of dollars that we're losing because some of them, the same guy buys it every year. And when you sit down and think that one tag uh, even if that one tag was put back into the, the general pool, it ain't going to make a, a diddly squat difference on your chances of drying. I think, I think Ken actually makes my point. I remember when the Antelope Island mule deer buck tag sold for $460,000 and the bitter life of them was 430. So let's give another, you know, millionaire an opportunity to, Buy an expensive tag. There's no shortage of millionaires, apparently. Except I think the same person bought that tag three years in a row, didn't? Uh, until he was outbid. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Chair, I saw Lindy join. Lindy, did you have something to, to add? Yeah, I just wanted to, to clarify some information on the expo tags. Um, so if you draw out for a limited entry permit, you don't obtain the waiting period but you can't apply for that hunt in the drawing. Like you can apply for a point, but you don't go through the drawing itself. But if you draw out for a once in a lifetime permit, you obtain the waiting period and you're no longer eligible to apply in the drawing for that permit again. So if you draw yeah. for a moose permit, you're done in the Utah draw. That's because awesome. Because it's once in a lifetime species. Yep. So we're basically and, talking about elk, deer, turkey, bear, stuff like that. Yep. Yeah. Maybe, yep. Maybe I misunderstood. I, I thought I thought we were talking about the conservation permits. You you were talking about waiting periods on Expo. And same with conservation, it, it, the same rule applies for conservation. Okay. You you don't get the waiting period on conservation limited entry permits, but on the once in a lifetime conservation permits, you get the waiting period as well. Yeah. Thanks for the clarification, Lindy. Appreciate it. Yep. No problem. Thank you. Any other questions or discussion? Uh, Brock, I'll, I'll make a comment. So um, I'll, I'll just echo what I said earlier. Um, the, the, the Habitat and Conservation Allocation meeting, the, the funding meeting was held last week. Um, we clarified earlier that video is out on YouTube still. If anybody has questions or is interested in learning where these uh, funds are spent, uh, go watch that video. It'll be very enlightening uh, and eye-opening, I think. And you'll see where where these funds are getting put on the ground. Um, there's some really awesome projects. In fact, um, the uh, I, I believe, and, and maybe Brock, you've got some input on this. The majority of the caller studies uh, that we've been learning just vast information vast amounts of information from are, are largely funded i believe by conservation dollars is that accurate brock so i believe the conservation dollars are used as matching money for pittman robertson funds that's why i haven't really commented on this topic i kind of have a conflict of interest and so uh, i'll come on on it brock <laughs> <laughs> it, yes uh, ben, we use a combination. It depends how the studies run, but if it's going through a university, we'll use a lot of waived overhead as the match. Uh, if we run it internally, um, which we do with a lot of them, then yes, the conservation permit funds will be the 25% match and 75% will usually be Pittman Robertson funds. Cool. All right. Um, Brock, I'm glad you mentioned that conflict of interest that reminded me i hadn't thought of this i probably have a conflict of interest on this agenda item as well 
Um, so with that, when the time comes, I, I would highly encourage everybody to um, support this. But uh, that said, I will um, abstain from voting on this item. Any other discussion? I'd entertain a motion. I'll, I'll make a motion that we accept as presented. The motion's been made by Ken. Do I have a second? I'll second. Was that Scott? It was two of us. Scott can Scott, have it. Chris? Yeah. Ah, I, did, I gave it to Christine last time. I'll give it to Scott this time. <laughs> okay, I'll call for a vote. Uh, ben, you're going to abstain? Yeah, I'll abstain or recuse myself, however it's properly worded. Christine? Yes. Danny? Yeah. Eric Reed? Yes. Josh Leonard? No, and for the record, um, th there's a portion of the memo that, that discusses preventing area of uh, potential fraud. I, I, I just wanted for the record stated, I think, I think there's a lot of concern among hunters more so than CWMU allocations and anything about conservation and expo tags that, uh, that, that, that this issue needs to be paid very closely attention to. We have no shortage of, uh, buyers for the resource that the DWR is providing, which is world-class wildlife. And so um, being very mindful of that fact, I, I think it's important that, um, that that this program is scrutinized heavily from start to finish because I, I think it's very much on the, the mind of hunters across the state. So, no. What, what do you mean by a fraud? By like somebody's cheating at the system or what? Reading, uh, sorry. Reading through Justin's memo, there's an entire uh, prevention area of potential fraud, discontinuing the ability of conservation organization. Like, as I as I review, I, I read it a week ago, and as I review it now, there's there's been comments that that there should be more uh, scrutiny to the conservation and expo program overall. And I'm just echoing Justin's memo in this case. Okay. Mr. Chair, I know you're in the middle of the vote. Can I clarify on this real quick? I I mean the the point of this, I, I think in a lot of ways we're saying the same thing. We're being proactive with our rule changes to prevent potential areas of fraud. As we as we looked at this and, and did this internal review, there was no actual fraud or wrongdoing. We're trying to strengthen a program that gets a lot of criticism. And so we're trying to make improvements. And, and make sure that, that those types of things don't happen. And so um, it, I, I know my memo talks about fraud, that's in the spirit of transparency, but it's potential fraud and, and no actual fraud or wrongdoing was approved. Thank you, Justin. Okay, Ken Strong, back to the vote. Yes. Uh, Mike Christensen. Yes. Scott Jensen. Yes. Uh, motion passes six to one with one abstention. Um, I have nothing else on the agenda. Does anybody have anything they want to bring up that they didn't bring up when we approve when we made a motion to approve the agenda? Uh, Mr. Chairman, I'd, I'd like to just make a, a further comment on on the this previous item, the conservation permit rule. Two things. One, I want to clarify the rule that we that was just voted on was purely conservation rule amendments. Um, we we put some uh, conversation in there about expo permits, but that was not part of the rule of amendment that we were voting on. And two, in my experience working with Justin especially and, and DWR, um, I would say that um, the integrity of this program, this is my perception of just Justin and, and his administering of it, is probably his number one priority in his entire job. Um, 
he's 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 in my experience he's done, done nothing but um, protect the integrity of this program. So uh, for what for what it's worth, that's that's my opinion. Thank you, Ben. Anything else? So just a reminder, I think we only made one alteration to the uh, agenda as proposed, but I would like that alteration to be noted in subsequent agendas that go to subsequent racks. So and I made a commitment to reach out to Stacy and Jason and see it, see what we could do there, and I'll bring that back. Yep. Thank you. Anything else? Seeing nothing, I move to adjourn. Second. If everybody uh, raises their hand, we don't have to go through the vote. Let's see it. I see a majority already, so I think we're adjourned. Thanks, everybody. Appreciate it.